So hello, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Sergio Carrera. I'm a senior research fellow at CEPS, the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels. And I'm welcoming you all to this uh, event, this uh, workshop, webinar, uh, organized in the context of the ASAIL project. ASAIL standing for Global Asylum Governance and the European Union's role. Um, I'm opening this webinar also make up in my capacity of uh, project uh, coordinator of ASAIL. SEPS is leading this consortium composed by leading universities and, and scholars on refugee uh, studies and migration studies, and also counting with civil society and UNHCR in the consortium. And the main objective of the project is really to critically assess emerging asylum governance instruments, both uh, those who have traditionally been, uh, let's say, uh, put forward and studied as examples of containment, refugee containment, but also others which come along with labels as mobility, facilitating legal pathways, complementary pathways, and mobility. And um, we look at several countries around the world, including Canada, uh, this is why it's such a special occasion today uh, to have this uh, workshop dedicated to Canada and also comparative uh, analysis with the European Union when it comes to dealing with asylum governance and responsibility uh, sharing. And we also include other countries, uh, but Canada is one of them. And I would like to thank especially Professor Audrey McLean and Joshua Bloom. They've been playing a very active role in the project um, and also contributing uh, with written input into the assessment of the Canadian system, which is available in our website, asylproject.eu. We have a global portal providing a country by country overview, critical overview of uh, governance instruments and actors. And we take a special, let's say, issue in the project uh, with evaluating those instruments in light, not only of their so-called effectiveness, but also fairness and consistency. And by consistency, I mean compatibility with refugee uh, protection and human rights uh, standards. So the project really aims at contributing to the state of the art uh, through the notion of contained mobility. Contained mobility, by this we mean that there are some instruments which present some containment features uh, traditionally studied and understood. Some of them we will study today like safe uh, third country agreements, uh, but also arrangements uh, aiming at expelling uh, applicants um, and individuals to countries of origin or transit. But also we see emerging instruments which come under complementary pathways or legal pathways, which also present containment and actually highly restrictive, selective and even discriminatory um, you know, um, features for having accessibility. To, to those instruments in an equality and non-discriminatory way. So today is a unique occasion really to bring together, you know, Canadian scholars and also asylum uh, network uh, members, key members, which have studied these uh, issues for a very long time, and also to shed, you know, some light on the work that the asylum project uh, is doing, um, not only respect to the Canadian system, but also in Europe the current you know, uh, policies in Europe, in particular the EU Dublin uh, system and the use of safe uh, country notions also in the EU um, within this context, which is presenting enormous challenges in the EU. <laughs> it has proved to be enormously challenging in its implementation and uh, widely understood as not working, as not working um, in practice. And, and that is why for many years, there's been an attempt to reform it. And we are still uh, on it, uh, on this promised reform of the Dublin system, basically getting rid of the Dublin system, I will say quite uh, clearly. Um, and hopefully we can also learn from this experience uh, when engaging internationally in, uh, on issues which are very much shared across uh, jurisdictions. So this is from my side what I would like to um, share. I look forward to all the uh, conversation and discussion. Um, I would like to leave now the floor to Professor Audrey, Audrey McLean, who is one of the leading refugee scholars internationally, and it's always a pleasure to work with her. 
Um, Audrey, you have the floor. Thank you, Sergio. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction to the Azal project its aims and ambition, and uh, the role that uh, Canadian scholars and the Canadian experience can play in it. Um, and I will say that uh, on behalf of Josh and I, it's been a real pleasure to be able to engage in this uh, thoughtful, critical, and really important um, project. Am I supposed to be looking back? Okay. Um, <laughs> Forgive me. I'm new to this. Um, so I want to say a few words. Um, Josh, uh, for those of you who haven't met him, I'll just say that Josh is an excellent immigration lawyer and also graduate of our master's program at University of Toronto, the Faculty of Law. And his work ranges across uh, refugee and immigration matters. And he is also one of the council involved in the constitutional challenge to the Safe Third Country Agreement. And so he brings both the um, academic uh, expertise as well as a lot of practical knowledge and experience to this. And I have been uh, so delighted and happy to work with him. Um, in deciding the topics that we will address in this webinar, we went with the comparison between Dublin and the STCA, as well as um, a discussion about uh, these complementary pathways. And one of the things, one of the reasons I think we chose that is because these two topics are in some sense mirror images of something Sergio was addressing, which is uh, restriction and facilitation. And in the STCA, you see a regime of restriction and exclusion designed to contain and constrain the movement of refugees, which is in turn subject to a few exceptions. And when we turn to what we think of as facilitation through complementary pathways and understand it as admission subject to exceptions, we understand that it itself is also highly restrictive. And so in fact, the theme of restriction happens to cut across both of these modes that we otherwise are tempted to think of as addressing something rather different. One is about keeping out and the other one is about letting in. Um, I would also say that there is a, a, an emerging or a growing interest in academic and policy uh, discussions about what is sometimes called diffusion of policy approaches, the ways in which policies spread from one country to another. Countries emulate one another, uh, countries take inspiration, they may adapt, adopt, or they may take other countries as object lessons in what not to do, a variety of things. The two case studies we are picking here happen to be good um, illustrations of diffusion processes because the Dublin, well, what is now the Dublin regulation used to be the Dublin convention has a long history and in fact clearly can clearly um, be shown to have inspired Canadian officials to develop what is now the Safe Third Country Agreement with the United States and Canada. This is, of course, designed as a mechanism of limiting the mobility of asylum seekers, refugee claimants. And so you can see very clearly in the historical record the diffusion of techniques of <coughs> exclusion, containment, restriction from Europe to Canada. Complementary pathways, refugee resettlement, appears to be something of an example of diffusion heading in the other direction. So Canada is often hailed, cited as a pioneer and a leader in refugee resettlement, and in particular, the particular so-called private or community sponsorship of refugees. Um, and indeed, those models have also started to grow into what are sometimes called complementary pathways involving economic selection of people who also happen to be refugees, but on the basis of their labor market skills as well as other kind of um, other pilot projects, other growing pro, 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 sorry, programs and models. But here I just want to highlight the idea of diffusion heading in the other direction, the appearance of diffusion from Canada uh, outwards to other regions of the world, including the EU. So if there is another kind of uniting um, theme between our two panels uh, today, it is also the idea of diffusion. 
what is adopted, what is changed, what stays the same, what's different, what lessons do countries learn from each other, and in particular, what assumptions and perhaps mistaken assumptions do jurisdictions carry from one to another about how the other system operates? And I think that's particularly relevant today for a discussion about the Safe Third Country Agreement, where in the challenge before the Supreme Court of Canada, there will be reliance and reference made to the Dublin Regulation. And it's critically important that everybody, all the parties before the court and the court, have an accurate understanding of how the Dublin Regulation works, its flaws and whatever its advantages are, how it is similar to, but more importantly, perhaps how it differs from the US-Canada Safe for Country Agreement. So I'm going to turn it over to Josh to lead us in the first panel about the Dublin Regulation and the STCA and to introduce the speakers. But uh, before I do that, I just want to say a few brief words about where we are and who I'd like to thank. So um, we are at the University of Toronto, and we are all who are physically present, are um, on the territory of the Huron Wendat Seneca and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit um, River. And uh, we are uh, home to many Indigenous peoples who continue to live and work on this territory, and we are grateful to live and work on this territory. And I think this is something that's always important to, to state very clearly at the outset of any discussion about migration, especially discussions about migration that take for granted uh, the entitlement of those of us who are in this room talking about being here to be here. Um, this is in fact contested and we should understand ourselves as having a somewhat tenuous claim to where we are. And I, that should, I hope, inform how we think about people who are seeking, striving, and need uh, to come here to this territory as well. So uh, I want to also thank people who have made this meeting possible. Um, getting together here in person, virtually, across time zones and long distances is not an easy task, even now with all of our experience under COVID. Um, and so I want to mention in particular, uh, here in Toronto, our communications officer at Criminology and Social Legal Studies, Yunolen Lozado, um, also um, David Tristall from uh, IT here at University of Toronto. And over on the SEF side, I want to thank Miriam Mir and, Z and Xavier Adib for making it possible for us all to gather in this way. So with all of that said, I am now going to turn it over to Josh to lead us in the first panel. And again, welcome and thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Audrey. So this session, this first session of our two is called A Tale of Two Safe Third Country Agreements. As uh, Audrey mentioned, we're fortunate to have both Canadian and European participants with us. And so it's a great opportunity for comparison for Canadians to see what insights we can glean about the STCA from learning about Dublin and it's how it's been implemented, for Europeans to see what lessons can be learned from the STCA, and in general, what truths we find about the safe third country concept in refugee law from looking at these two different manifestations of it in two different places side by side. So this is an, interest, an interesting time to do this because of course in less than a month, the Supreme Court of Canada will decide the legality of the Canada-US SDCA. Meanwhile, the legitimacy of Dublin, as Sergio mentioned, remains an open question as its legitimacy has been disputed on several grounds. Before we get to our two excellent guest speakers, Prasanna Balasundram and Professor Jans Bedsted Hansen, we wanted to provide a basic background on the two systems in case someone knows about one but not the other. Um, we've sent around in advance a side-by-side -side chart with some of the basic features of, of both, both, uh, both systems. Um, I also, for those of us who aren't going laptop in person, we have a few hard copies if you, if you want to take one and pass it around. Thank you. I'm not going to go through the, the chart in detail, but I just want to emphasize one similarity and one difference to shape or frame our discussion. So the major similarity is that obviously as safe third country agreements, both, both agreements operate under the same foundational principle, and that's that refugees should claim protection in the first quote unquote safe country that they arrive. 
in the in the C Q as Canada as TACA. This is traveling through one country. And you try to claim at another, and you're turned away because to claim in the first place you landed. In Europe, this operates by if you land your your claim is assigned to the place that issued you a visa that allowed you into the EU. If you don't have a visa, if you entered without documents, you are returned to the first place you encountered authorities where you are fingerprinted and there's a common database called Eurodac that every Dublin member state can see. I've seen this called by, by European commentators as a dis disciplinary function of Dublin, where essentially it's your failure of migration control that led someone in, so into the EU, so you have to determine their claim. And I think for Canadians, we might recognize this as US visa policies are comparatively, it's a little bit easier to get a US visa where it's impossible to get a Canadian visa. And there's something similar maybe operating in our context. So as uh, Audrey and others have pointed out, these agreements, they're pitched as responsibility sharing agreements. But as you might notice, there's nothing about that country of first arrival principle that leads to an equal distribution of responsibility. If anything, it turns away on it. And what it really distributes people is on the lines of, along the lines of geography, meaning the place that is easiest for refugees to originally get to is where the bulk of the claims under one of these systems are going to be determined. In Canada, if you want to seek, in the Canada-US context, if you want to seek asylum in the United States, there's no reason you would ever go to Canada. It's out of the way. But if you're someone who can't show a Canadian visa officer that you have lots of money and you need to try to get to Canada by land, you have to pass through the United States in order to get to Canada. That's why I would say 99% of the claims under the Canada U where the STCA applies are people trying to claim in Canada who are turned back to the US. It's a completely one directional agreement. You see a similar distribution on geography in, in the EU, of course, where as many people has been noted for a long time that it's the southern border countries, Greece and Italy, that, that share a disproportionate responsibility for determining the claims, whereas people are pushed away from the richer inland European countries. Um, <clears throat> so that's a similarity, the country of first arrival. It is both in both cases subject to provisions for family unity. I've read that in the European context, that's not applied as well in practice. In the Canadian context, there are some administrative issues, but there is a separate law that punishes you for using these family unity exceptions to the STCA, where if your claim is rejected, it removes your appeal because you tried to claim in the same place as your family members. Um, those are the similarities, the kind of founding logic. A difference and a very big difference is where these agreements apply. Dublin is largely an inland process while the application of the SDCA happens at the Canada-US border. It's a border process. Dublin came in originally at the same time as the Schengen system, removing internal borders in Europe. And it mostly happens inland. The assessment takes place inland. And critically, for those who followed the STCA challenge in Canada, there is a right to an effective remedy under the Dublin, the Dublin 3, under the Dublin regulation. And there is an, a way to challenge your transfer under Dublin. And it can, be transfer, it can be challenged on the basis of a systemic flaw in the other country's asylum system. In Canada, this is a border process. It's a peremptory process and returns happen in a matter of hours in many cases. A large part of the STCA challenge is that in many, in many, in many situations, there are people who are going to be returned to the US who have no recourse against the blanket application of the STCA. And again, the, the, the STCA was modeled in many ways after the experience of Dublin, and part of the reason the STCA only applies at the border is because of the difficulty in finding where people have been and in making those transfers. That's why despite all of this being based on this country of first arrival principle, if you fly into Canada from the US, the STCA doesn't apply. If you enter inland from the US, the STCA doesn't apply although it is in the background that there's, there's attempts to expand the agreement potentially. So 
so those are those are kind of key differences. It's the same logic, but it's how it plays out in Canada and, and in the US versus Europe are a bit different. Um, what I'm going to do now is turn it over to our first speaker, Prasanna Balasandaram, who is the Director of Downtown Legal Services at the University of Toronto and one of my co-counsel in the STCA Challenge. He's going to talk about the, the litigation that's happening, where we're at, and some of the main issues. I want to flag that uh, after, after Professor Vestip Hansen and after Prasanna have spoke, we're going to be taking questions, and we want to really drill in on some of these comparisons and help to understand the, the STCA and Dublin a little more. At any time during, uh, during these presentations, those who have a question can write it in the chat on Zoom. Audrey will then be the voice of the chat when we open it up for questions. And uh, at the time and at the question time, if you do want to speak and ask your question, you can also raise your hand in this room or in, in the Zoom room, and uh, I will call on you. So with that, I will now turn it over to Prasanna. Thanks so much, Josh. Um, as Josh mentioned, I have the incredible privilege of being on this council team that has brought this challenge forward. I should also say I have the privilege of being Audrey's uh, colleague here at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. So thank you for, for the invitation to speak. In um, this brief presentation, what I intend to do is um, lay out the statutory scheme that sets out the Safe Third Country Agreement with the United States briefly describe the applicants, get into some of the arguments that were made and sort of um, summarize the court decisions um, from the federal court as well as the federal court of appeal. Um, as Audrey and Josh mentioned, um, the Supreme Court will hear um, arguments on this case in early October and will wait eagerly to see uh, what ultimately gets decided in this challenge. So um, the framework for the Safe Third Country Agreement is set out in the Canadian Immigration Refugee Protection Act, specifically at section 101.1e. Um, a claim is ineligible to be referred to the Refugee Protection Division if a claimant entered Canada from a designated country. So essentially, the Refugee Protection Division is the forum of first instance where a refugee claim is determined. And so this provision renders ineligible uh, a refugee claimant from having their claim determined by the Refugee Protection Division. Um, further in the act, uh, there's some guidance with respect to um, who, which country can be designated. So a designated country must comply Again, the emphasis here on must comply with the non reform law requirement of the Refugee Convention, as well as the Convention Against Torture. And finally, in determining whether or not a country can be designated, one of the factors that ought to be considered is the country's policies and practices uh, regarding claims under the Refugee Convention and the Convention Against Torture. So this is the framework for the Safe Third Country Agreement. This framework is fleshed out in greater detail in the regulations that are passed pursuant to the Immigration Refugee Protection Act. So specifically section 159.3 designates the United States as a safe third country. It is the only country that is designated. Um, so it's crucial to note that there is a potential of further designations. As Josh mentioned, um, pursuant to section 159.5, there are certain enumerated exceptions to the operation of the Safe Third Country Agreement at a port of entry. Um, so the main one that is invoked are anchor relatives, but there are also exceptions to unaccompanied minors, persons who are subject to the death penalty, and a, and a number of other uh, limited categories of exceptions. Crucially, an immigration officer who is determining eligibility at the port of entry has no discretion with respect to the Safe Third Country Agreement. If none of the enumerated exceptions apply, um, then 
the operation of the STCA is invoked and a claimant is returned to the custody of US officials. Um, and again, just as a point of contrast, uh, there is no right to counsel at these eligibility determinations, and there is really no meaningful way at the port of entry to uh, challenge uh, these eligibility decisions and the operation of the STC. So I just want to kind of review some of the background to this litigation. Um, you know, in November of 2016, Trump gets elected. As you may recall, in January of 2017, there were a series of executive orders that were passed. And this really um, shot fear uh, throughout um, the refugee advocate community, uh, as well as many migrants in the United States. Um, and so there were these cross-border discussions of the possibility of another challenge. I should note that there had been a previous challenge that provided the neutral citations there. Um, the challenge was successful at the federal court, uh, overturned on appeal at the federal court of appeal and uh, leave to the Supreme Court was denied. And so um, there was some very serious discussion about how another challenge could be framed. And uh, sure enough, uh, a challenge came together in the early part of 2017. There were three individual applicants that were involved in the challenge. The first was uh, the Hamzi family. They were a family from Syria. Uh, they were in the United States and approached um, the Canadian border to make a claim for refugee protection after the passage of the executive order, which denied Syrian nationals entry uh, to the United States as refugees. Um, the second individual uh, applicant uh, was ABC, who was an El Salvadoran woman who approached the border with two minor children. Um, she claimed uh, refugee protection in June of 2017. She had faced uh, gang-based persecution in El Salvador, and she was a survivor of some quite serious uh, sexual violence. Finally, the third individual applicant was Nadira Mustafa. She was an Ethiopian woman who had actually arrived in the U.S. as a child, was unaware of, of her status, um, and then uh, once Trump had come into power and through the passage of these executive orders, she came to realize that um, she was at risk of being removed to Ethiopia. Um, she understood that based on her ethnicity, that she would be subject to persecution there. She also recognized that there were certain procedural bars to pursuing an asylum claim in the United States. And so she approached the border in June of 2017, um, was found ineligible by operation of the SCCA, returned to the US and was um, detained uh, in a uh, correctional facility in upstate New York. Um, and I'll get into sort of uh, the relevance of her detention to the case in a moment. These three individual applicants were joined by three public interest standing parties um, that is the Canadian Council for Refugees, the Canadian Council of Churches and Amnesty International. These three same public interest parties were involved in the previous litigation, had some deep institutional knowledge about the impact of the Safe Third Country Agreement and um, had very crucially important cross-border sort of networks um, of scholars and advocates uh, that we were able to draw on uh, to constitute the record um, that the constitutional challenge was anchored to. So in broad strokes, there were two categories of arguments um, that were marshaled uh, to uh, take down the Safe Third Country Agreement. The first was a set of administrative law arguments and the second was a set of constitutional law arguments. I'm just gonna briefly go over um, both. With respect to the administrative law arguments, the argument was essentially that the designation of the United States as a safe third country was ultra virus, the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. Um, effectively, the ongoing designation was inconsistent with the statutory purpose. And as uh, Audrey and Josh said, the statutory purpose, which had been recognized in the previous uh, litigation, was that of refugee responsibility sharing. Um, and quite simply, the argument was that the continuing designation was unreasonable 
because the record clearly demonstrated that the United States did not comply with the convention as well as other human rights obligations. And the second administrative law argument um, was that certain condition precedents that were set out in the architecture of the Safe Third Country Agreement had not been met. And therefore, the ongoing designation of the United States could not be maintained. The two condition precedents specifically were the continuing monitoring of policies and practices, as well as the human rights record. And the second being the ability of the governor and council to reassess maintaining the designation if there had been a change in these factors. And so clearly, um, given the developments um, of the Trump administration in particular, but also the historical record of um, the US policies and practices with respect to asylum, the argument was that maintaining this designation was, was unreasonable um, in light of this very important condition precedent. Um, so in order to assess and reassess the designation, the Canadian state had developed a monitoring framework but the effect of it was essentially that it involved delegation from the governor and council, which is what the statute uh, mandated uh, should be doing the review to the minister, and then a further subdelegation to immigration, refugees, and citizenship Canada. And um, the effect of this delegation and subdelegation, uh, we argued, was that there was no meaningful opportunity uh, to review this ongoing designation. And so um, the argument was that the GIC was not in a meaningful position to assess maintaining the designation and was therefore ultra vires um, the, the act. With respect to the constitutional arguments, they were anchored to two sections of our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The first was section seven, which sets out that everyone has a right to life, liberty and security of person and the right not to be deprived except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. And the argument here was that the Safe Third Country Agreement engages liberty and security of person interests of refugee claimants who are determined to be ineligible. With respect to liberty, um, the record clearly demonstrated that um, an ineligibility decision at the Canadian border would result in detention in the United States and with respect to the security of person uh, interest, we anchored that to a heightened risk of lethal law in the um, US asylum system due to certain aspects of that system that included the one year bar, um, the sort of exceptionally poor treatment of uh, gender based claims, uh, detention, as well as criminalization of asylum seekers. And um, the second part of that argument was that the section seven interests of liberty and security of person were deprived in a manner that was contrary to the principles of fundamental justice because there was a fundamental disconnect between the objective of the safe third country agreement, essentially refugee responsibility sharing and the impact on the claimants themselves. The second, um, prong of the constitutional argument relied on the equality provision in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, that is section 15, which sets out that any law which in purpose or effect creates a distinction based on an enumerated or analogous ground and whose impact perpetuates a disadvantage or stereotype of a group contravenes section 15. And so here um, we relied on the enumerated ground of sex and quite simply the argument was that the US system fails women refugee claimants. Uh, we drew once again on a historical record uh, with respect to the treatment of gender within um, the nexus of a particular social group, but we emphasized the AB decision that had um, been issued and essentially foreclosed uh, at the time, the possibility of uh, at least a large uh, swath of gender-based claims. We also relied on the gendered impact of the one year bar, um, as well as uh, the gendered impact of detention. 
uh, to demonstrate that women refugee claimants were really disadvantaged uh, in the uh, US asylum system. So uh, those were the arguments. Um, what I'll do now is briefly summarize the decisions of the federal court and the federal court of appeal. Um, the federal court rejected the administrative law argument, uh, deciding that the issue um, had been decided in the previous litigation and there were no grounds to depart from, from binding authority. Um, However, the federal court did go on to accept the Section 7 uh, charter argument. Uh, Justice McDonald was persuaded by the arguments on detention and determined that uh, the detention of uh, refugee claimants in the United States engages both the liberty and security of person interests. And um, she ultimately determined that they were contrary to the principles of fundamental justice uh, specifically that they were overbroad, essentially the deprivation of liberty had no connection to that objective of refugee responsibility sharing, and that it was also grossly disproportionate. Essentially, there couldn't be uh, a justifiable balance given the conditions and effect of detention uh, and the heightened uh, risk of reformat. Uh, that detained refugee claimants uh, face in the United States. Um, so as I had said at the outset, she was quite persuaded by the, the evidence uh, in the record about detention. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm just, the, the decision is obviously well worth reading. I just flagged that um, she wrote at paragraph 113, the circumstances raise security of person interests and flow directly from the actions of Canadian officials in returning claimants to the US where they're imprisoned. In this context, it is the impact of detention and not the current state of US asylum law, which raises security of person interests. The accounts of the detainees demonstrate both physical and psychological suffering because of detention and a real risk that they will not be able to assert the asylum claims. So, um, it was, it was obviously a very significant victory at the federal court. Um, the state appealed and, uh, the matter went to the federal court of appeal. Um, the federal court of appeals decision, um, was essentially that the constitutional arguments that the applicants brought were fundamentally misconceived. Um, and, Justice Stratus, writing for a three-member panel of the Federal Court of Appeal, stated essentially that the applicants cherry-picked two provisions out of a very complex interrelated scheme uh, and that this approach was fundamentally wrong. Um, and the Federal Court of Appeal's view was essentially that it was the reviews of the ongoing designation, the statutory provision that mandated the ongoing reviews that should have been part of uh, this attack because um, it was that provision as well as a related administrative conduct that were the real causes of um, the charter infringements, if there were any. And so um, they overturned Justice McDonald's um, charter findings, they quash that decision, and um, they go on to say, look, it, it may not even be the case that this is a charter case, that perhaps this should have been um, more properly brought as what we would consider a judicial review of administrative conduct, uh, and, and go on to sort of describe what the proper approach might have been. Um, so, Clearly, there's, there's an arguable issue here because the Supreme Court of Canada granted leave, um, and uh, we're hoping that uh, the, the Supreme Court of Canada will reinstitute um, the federal court decision and sort of um, cast aside uh, the reasoning of the federal court of appeal, but that remains to be determined. Um, so that's it for me. I'm hoping that that provided at least somewhat of an orientation in terms of the, the litigation. And I know that there are a few members of the council team that are present. So um, yeah, we can all hop in if there are questions at some point. Yeah, 
first time. Um, so now turning over to Europe, we're lucky to be joined by Professor Jens Vedstedt Hansen from Aarhus University in Denmark. And uh, we've asked him to start by talking about giving us an orientation to some of the key issues with Dublin and then where the, the efforts at reform, recasting, eliminating may be at, at this time. So thank you so much, Professor Vedstedt Hansen. Hello everyone. Um, good morning, I should say, to those uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. Good afternoon to those here in Europe. I'm pleased to be here um, and uh, I think it's a great idea to, to use the uh, concept of a sealed regional workshop to do this comparative approach to a somewhat similar uh, procedural devices or mechanisms uh, in uh, Northern America and, uh, and in Europe. Um, as already mentioned, uh, I'm going to say a few things about uh, the, the Dublin system, but in fact, I'm going to start a bit wider than that, because if we, if we look at the notions of safe third country in EU asylum law, and let me just make clear that, that from now on, I'm, I'm a bit unreasonable, maybe identifying Europe with the EU, uh, the EU is certainly not the whole world and not even the full Europe, but still uh, we to, I'm focusing on, on EU asylum law. And in EU asylum law, uh, we actually have various safe third country concepts. Um, and I'd like to just give an overview and then zoom in uh, on one or two of them. Uh, the basic distinction goes between uh, those addressing non-member states uh, and those applying to intra-EU or intra-member intra, intra state uh, issues. Um, and in fact, uh, if we uh, do a search for the term safe third country, it is uh, enshrined in the Asylum Procedures Directive uh, as one of the reasons for uh, non-admission or non-inadmissibility of asylum applications with reference to a non-member state, uh, which is to be considered uh, a, a safe third country. Um, more in, in, more in some more detail, we actually have two different, yet partly similar rules on inadmissibility. Uh, <coughs> sorry, one is in article 35 of the Recast Asylum Procedures Directive, which refers to the notion of first country of asylum while the formal safe third country rule is laid down in Article uh, 38 of the uh, directive. In both cases, uh, the reference is made to a non-member state to which an asylum seeker can be referred, so to say, as a ground for inadmissibility of the application and therefore also by <coughs> as a ground for uh, refusing not entry to the territory, but at least entry to the uh, or access to the uh, substantive determination procedure in any EU member state. We may come back to this aspect of the, the, the EU safe third country notion, but I'll leave it for now because I think what, what has the bigger interest in the comparative uh, perspective between North America and, and Europe is probably rather two other mechanisms that allow for transfer of asylum applicants or applications or both in fact uh, between EU member states. And there, as already uh, indicated by uh, Joshua, um, the Dublin regulation is the primary uh, mechanism. Uh, so I'll focus mostly on this one, but just mention and come back to the fact that there is also actually an additional uh, mechanism which operates a bit in between uh, those I just mentioned and the Dublin regulation. This is uh, linked to the fact that the Dublin regulation is about uh, responsibility for examining asylum applications. And formally speaking, once an asylum application has been definitively decided upon, the Dublin regulation is out of place, so to say. Uh, and then we have a parallel, parallel regime uh, in the Asylum Procedures Directive in cases where a person has been granted protection in one member state and then continues to another member state. 
But now let me focus on Dublin. Uh, and let me first mention that, uh, that Dublin, as well as actually the, uh, the other intra-EU uh, inadmissibility ground, are both reflecting the principle of mutual trust, which is an overriding uh, principle within what is in, in EU lingo termed as the, the area of freedom, security, and justice, or in this continent, just AFSJ. Uh, this principle reflects a presumption of compliance with legal obligations under EU law, as well as under international law. Um, and it is sort of underlying various um, legal mechanisms. Uh, uh, it is indeed central to asylum law, uh, but it also uh, applies beyond asylum law. Uh, the most notable examples is probably the European arrest warrant, which uh, allows for and even demands actually the uh, extradition of citizens of one member state to another member state in certain defined uh, situations. Um, and in whatever situation we are talking about uh, application or invocation of the principle of mutual trust, it is important to, to, to emphasize that this principle or this presumption is not irrebuttable. We have seen that in important cases concerning the uh, European arrest warrant, we have also in recent years seen it in very different uh, settings concerning uh, failed states, if you want, within the EU, not least uh, uh, cases concerning the judicial system in a, in, in a member state like, in particular, Poland, where there have also been uh, increasing uh, challenges uh, to the principle of mutual trust. But let me now go back to the asylum area and in particular the Dublin regulation. In fact, we have seen uh, for more than two decades, when it was al already only the Dublin Regulation, sorry, Convention of 1990, we have seen objections raised against uh, the application of the presumption or the principle of mutual trust uh, as early as uh, 2000. Uh, some of these cases and the first ones indeed were actually raised before the European Court of Human Rights uh, normally uh, invoking Article 3 of the European Convention on, on uh, Human Rights. Article 3 is, as you probably know, the prohibition of torture and uh, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Uh, and in various uh, situations, it has been argued that transfers to another member state under the Dublin Convention or regulation would violate the prohibition of various degrees of ill treatment under Article 3. The first case ever was uh, decided uh, by the European Court of Human Rights as early as 2000, which was a Sri Lankan Tamil applicant who had been uh, moving on from Germany to the UK. And then the UK wanted to transfer him back to Germany where he argued that this would, would in fact be indirect, indirect of Le Mans because in Germany, uh, as opposed to the UK, he was unlikely to be, uh, to be granted asylum and therefore would be at risk of, of further um, uh, deportation back to Sri Lanka. In this case, uh, the European Court of Human Rights laid down the, 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 the basic principle that a member state, or sorry, a convention state, it is here, uh, to the Convention on Human Rights cannot discard its obligations under the convention by reference to uh, bilateral or multilateral uh, conventions that will sort of enable it to uh, move a person out of its jurisdiction to another uh, state's jurisdiction. So the principle was made clear, the Dublin Convention did not uh, dis dis discharge uh, the UK of its responsibility uh, under the uh, Human Rights Convention. In the concrete case, uh, the, 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 Nothing more happened because uh, during the case, Germany had sort of issued some, some, some promises or guarantees to the effect that it would, it would positively reconsider the application. So it was actually considered or declared inadmissible before the Strasbourg court, but the principle was laid down. And then the next series of cases uh, concerning uh, this principle uh, or the, uh, the, the scope of this principle then came in the late uh, zeros when the collapse or 
increasingly uh, dysfunction uh, of the Greek asylum system became more and more evident. First, in a case from 2008, the Human Rights Court uh, somewhat uh, blindly maybe um, uh, insisted that, uh, that there was a presumption that Greece would be in compliance with its, uh, with its obligations under EU law and international law. And there was also a somewhat arrogant reference to, um, to the, 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 the fact that uh, the, the uh, claimant would be able to uh, bring Greece before the Strasbourg Court of Human Rights in case uh, he did not feel appropriately uh, treated in Greece. So that case was, was uh, uh, dismissed. Finally, we had a decisive turn uh, in this series of cases in 2011 with the case of MSS versus Belgium uh, and Greece. Again, it was a case about, like the, the, the 2008 case, it was a case about an asylum seeker who had been uh, transferred under the Dublin uh, regulation, as it, as it now was, uh, from Belgium back to Greece. A bit ironically, he had actually uh, tried to get, an, to get interim measures uh, from the Court of Human Rights, which was refused. But uh, that notwithstanding, uh, later on, the Human Rights Court in Strasbourg held Belgium to be uh, responsible for violation of Article 3 uh, of the uh, human, uh, European Human Rights Convention because it knew or ought to have known, uh, as it was held, that the, both the reception conditions and the asylum system in Greece was suffering from such systemic uh, flaws that there would be a uh, real risk of um, uh, ill treatment under Article 3, both because of uh, the situation uh, in which uh, the applicant would be left as an asylum seeker in Greece, and also because of the uncertainty uh, that his uh, case would be subjected to a serious examination by the Greek authorities. Uh, and this was quite a, quite a, a landmark decision, both because finally uh, the Strasbourg court realized how things were in, in Greece. They had, and ought, I would say, ought to have known at least uh, long before uh, that this was the case. But there were some specific circumstances, not least a letter from the UNHCR to the Belgian, uh, gov Belgian government just before the uh, transfer back to Greece of the uh, applicant, which was considered decisive in the case. So interestingly, both Belgium and Greece were held responsible. Belgium for transferring the applicant back to Greece, knowing or, or at least ought, having ought to know uh, the situation in Greece and Greece itself for having actually violated his uh, uh, rights under the convention due to the uh, failing uh, reception conditions and the uh, in, in, insufficient uh, asylum system. Then we saw a number of cases uh, concerning Dublin transfers between various, you could say, Northwestern European countries and some other countries in the years to come. Some of them were about transfers back to Greece. Some were uh, new scenarios where the destination country would be Italy. And later on, we even saw cases concerning Malta and uh, Cyprus and Bulgaria. I think these were the most prominent cases, but mostly Greece and uh, Italy. Uh, and uh, I think it is uh, quite fair to say that the Strasbourg court was not very clear uh, and it uh, made a rather uh, sort of inconsistent series of decisions between 2011 and 2014. Then we had another landmark decision, the Tarakel versus Switzerland judgment in November 2014, which was about transfer of a of a um, uh, of a, a, a family of Afghanis uh, from Switzerland to Italy, and in that case, it was made clear on the one hand uh, that the Italian asylum system and reception system, uh, in particular was not as deficient as that in Greece, but at the same time was, it was recognized by the Strasbourg Court of Human Rights 
that the situation with reception conditions, in particular for families with children, were deficient in Italy to such an extent that Switzerland would not be allowed to transfer these people to Italy unless they would have concrete individual guarantees that the family would be uh, accommodated uh, in the same place to respect family unity and in appropriate conditions. Not least the extreme vulnerability of children in addition to the, the particular vulnerability of asylum seekers in general were sort of uh, pronounced as underlying principles by the Strasbourg Court in a very, very interesting judgment. Um, I think it was met with some concern in European states because they would argue that this principle of the idea of obtaining individual guarantees would make the Dublin system uh, more or less uh, inefficient uh, uh, or inoperational. Um, that may be the reason why we saw then again after this landmark decision, we have seen a number of cases uh, in which the Strasbourg court sort of step back uh, and on more or less clear reasons with more or less uh, um, lack of uh, consistency towards the principles in, in the Grand Chamber judgment in Tarkel, um, refused admissibility uh, with, with some rather strange uh, reasonings sometimes. So this is the one of the, the, the one, one track, so to say, uh, towards uh, deciding uh, objections against Dublin transfers and hence implicitly challenges to the principle of mutual, of mutual trust underlying uh, the Dublin uh, system. In parallel, we have seen <coughs> we have seen cases before the EU Court of Justice uh, in Luxembourg, uh, and as you know, uh, the EU Court of Justice does not deal with individual complaints over actual violations, but normally deals with. Uh, references of uh, cases from domestic courts in member states seeking at, at, uh, at a general interpretation of EU law. So the framing of the Luxembourg cases has been very different. It started actually with a case that ran in parallel with the MSS judgment pending in, 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 in Strasbourg. And maybe it was pretty convenient for the EU Court of Justice that it could sort of put its interpretation of the Dublin, sorry, yeah, of the Dublin regulation on, 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 on pause while the Strasbourg Court of Human Rights was then assessing realities on the ground uh, in Greece in the MSS case. So in the case uh, named NS and ME, that was a, a joint cases uh, referred by an Irish and a British uh, court to the EU Court of Justice, uh, the EU court gave its interpretation of the document regulation um, in ways that sort of very clearly uh, expressed the principle that uh, the presumption of mutual trust or the principle of mutual trust is not irrebuttable. Uh, that was made very clear uh, by the uh, EU Court of Justice. Um, and in this case, uh, it was again uh, objections towards or against uh, transfers to Greece. And therefore the, the, the underlying uh, reasoning of the EU Court of Justice was referring to both reception conditions and asylum procedures being uh, deficient in the country of destination. It is hard to say whether the EU Court of Justice was uh, following uh, the, the line of reasoning or analysis uh, sort of uh, that has been established over decades by the uh, Strasbourg Court of Human Rights concerning uh, non refoulement under Article 3 of the European Convention, which is corresponding to Article 4 of the EU Charter uh, of Fundamental Rights. There, were, there was reasoning in the EU Court's uh, judgment in, S, in, in um, NS and ME, which seemed to suggest a more narrow assessment requiring apparently uh, systemic flaws, which is not Strasbourg language at all, uh, and even requiring flaws, systemic flaws, in both reception conditions and asylum procedures. Um, it may have been uh, intentional in order to narrow down uh, the barriers to, to transfer. It may also have been maybe based on more general concerns not to uh, 
not to 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 modify the principle of mutual trust too too much so to say at least it is fair safe to say that the eu court of justice has later on sort of modified these uh, these uh, criteria or underlying principles uh, of uh, of uh, rebutting uh, the principle of mutual trust a new scenario has come up then uh, which is not just about inefficient reception conditions uh, and asylum procedures, but which goes more specifically to the material conditions. And that has then also sort of activated another provision because some of these cases where material conditions in a member state have been challenged are cases concerning um, people who have been granted asylum uh, in another member state. Hence, they are not like, no longer within the scope of the Dublin regulation, but may instead be considered uh, inadmissible under this Article 33 of the uh, Asylum Procedures Directive. Uh, and just to illustrate the potential scope of, of, of this type of cases, uh, you may know that uh, there have been sort of really many uh, persons granted protection already in, in one member state who have moved on to other member states. I think I, I read recently a figure of around 50,000, at least 40, I think 50,000 persons who have been granted protection in Greece, but moved on in particular to Germany. Last year, I think there were governments in a handful of member states which approached the European Commission um, and actually copied also the Greek government, uh, arguing that this was uh, unacceptable because it was an, an unreasonable sort of kind of asylum shopping for people who had already been granted asylum in Greece. And again, it might point to, um, to, to, to deficiencies in the Greek protection system. Uh, here again, and maybe even more so, uh, the EU Court of Justice has laid down very uh, narrow criteria for rebutting the presumption of compliance with EU law. Um, in March 2019, on the very same date, in fact, the EU Court of Justice uh, delivered two judgments, one about uh, transfer under Dublin, uh, a case named Yavo, and another one concerning uh, inadmissibility for people uh, who are seeking asylum in member state number two, upon having been granted protection already in, in, in a first member state. That's the case of Ibrahim and others. And in, in here again, uh, but very, very uh, strong words actually, the EU court on the one hand accepts that the principle of mutual trust is not irrebuttable, but at the, time, at the same time sets a very high threshold for rebutting uh, the presumption of compliance. Uh, Ibrahim was uh, about various uh, refugees. Most of them were stateless Palestinians from, from Syria who had been granted protection in Bulgaria. And it was very clear, uh, no, I know, happen to know a bit about the Bulgarian uh, asylum and protection system, which is really, really uh, uh, substandard. Um, so they argued that they would have very poor material conditions and they also had some, some um, uh, challenges uh, against the Bulgarian recognition practice. Uh, and on both counts, the EU courts set a very high threshold for uh, rebutting the, the presumption of uh, mutual trust, uh, uh, which would then sort of get these people off the hook and prevent them from being um, referred to their already uh, uh, existing uh, formal protection in Bulgaria. We don't know, I don't know at least, what happened with the case uh, ultimately, because as you know, these preliminary rulings from the EU Court of Justice are then um, being taken over by the domestic courts, which are dealing with the case uh, and, and which are sort of uh, uh, drawing the final conclusions in, in the concrete situations. Um, I think I'll leave it with this, if time allows, and if anybody is interested, I could give a few quotes from the latter judgment, which are quite striking, in fact, not to say deeply concerning, but I'll save it for now and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Vested Hansen. That was great. Um, 
So what we wanted to do now is to open up, up for questions from any participants. Uh, I'll be honest, there was an ulterior motive among co-counsel for the, the appellants in the SDCA and interveners to try to get Professor Vedsip Hansen's view from, from the EU and the Dublin system on some of the big issues that, that are playing out in, in our challenge. Um, I'd like to start with one of those issues just very quickly and then we'll open it up to the room. That's this question of systemic flaws. Are, are in, it seems like in the EU, EU case law, it's a breakdown of an asylum system as a whole or in reception conditions. What we have in the US is, is a functioning asylum system, but specific types of claims where they won't be granted protection from um, or from lots under refugee convention standards, like gender-based claims or people who are time barred from making a claim. Have there been, has there been jurisprudence in the EU on, on that kind of systemic flaw for a specific kind of claim? And if there is, what is the what is the standard that they're using? Who who's the judge of what's uh, What's a systemic flaw? The problem again is that it is the EU Court of Justice which has created this threshold of systemic flaw. Uh, uh, and to some extent, it has sort of modified it again. But then it is up to domestic courts to, uh, to apply it or implement it in concrete uh, circumstances. Um, as regards the situation you are aiming at, uh, uh, there have been problems. Uh, I, I don't uh, know of any cases in which the problem was uh, a time barred case in the member state considered responsible. But there have been a, has been a similar problem, I think, with Hungary, uh, and it may be similar in other member states, where a person who has applied for asylum and then makes secondary movements and, and applies again in another member state, that, that person's case may be considered as withdrawn in the first member state, that is in, in the example, it is Hungary. And that may be a problem then uh, for, for, the, for the Dublin uh, regulation to apply. Um, but there, I think there have been some attempts to persuade the member state responsible to, to issue guarantees that it will reopen the case uh, or admit it for, 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 for being reopened. But I, I have no knowledge of, of time barring here. And I, I, I doubt actually that it could be the case because, um, because uh, the asylum procedures regulation, which is binding on all member states except Denmark and maybe Ireland, I forgot that, um, does not allow for such time barring really. Um, so so it, it shouldn't occur as far as I can think. Is, is there uh, anyone here who would, would like to pose a question? So just on that point, though, um, there was a decision right involving Germany about um, not acceptance of non-state agent cases of persecution. So I think that's along the lines of what might be helpful um, in the uh, in the litigation. Right. I think that's that's Aiden or the, the House of Lords case. If so I know what well, this is, doing, this is a, a somewhat outdated case, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, I know when we were doing research for our intervention factor, it was difficult to find uh, yeah. case law on that point, but uh, that was something that did stand out. It, it was indeed a problem uh, in Germany. Um, to, to get recognition of non-state aid into persecution. But I think the problem has, I wouldn't say gone away, but at least been quite diminished uh, since, the, uh, since the entry into force of the qualification directive, which is very clear in accepting non-state aid into persecution. And I think everyone was sort of very anxious to see 20 years ago what Germany would, how would they would uh, respond to that uh, directive proposal, but they accepted it actually. Any, anyone else who'd like to pose a question? I have a question. It's also um, motivated by the case that we're litigating and thinking, thinking through some of the issues. But one of the, you know, the, the sort of main thrust of the argument in the challenge to the safe third country agreement here is 
okay, fine, you can have a safe third country agreement, but there needs to be a number of additional exceptions built into it, or at least discretion on the part of Canadian officials to not apply it to certain people. And the government's response to that is largely, well, it would be just unworkable to have that many exceptions or to give discretion to officers assessing claims. And I'm just looking at this chart that was prepared, and it seems that the takeaway from the European experience is that the transfer process is bogged down and not very many actually get carried out, partially because of all these procedural protections that are in place. Is that, in your view, a sort of accurate description of the, of the situation in the EU, that few transfers happen because of administrative bureaucracies surrounding them? It is indeed true, true that the, the number of actual Dublin transfers either take back or, 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 or take taking over by other member states uh, is very low. Um, I, I have no, no concrete detailed information about the uh, relative influence of various reasons, but I do think that the uh, administrative procedures and the time limits in the Dublin regulation uh, perhaps taken together also with evidential evidentiary problems uh, are uh, important reasons for that. I see one question in the chat. Uh, do you have a uh, we have a question from an attendee, but I don't know who it is. So perhaps that person can be unmuted, or I can uh, can uh, email me the question or uh, put it in the chat. Uh, Miriam, is it possible for you to do that? In the meantime, Roberto and Sergio also have a question or a comment. So why don't we take them first, and then we'll come back to the person uh, who's in the audience. Thank you. And I just wanted to thank both. Uh, both presentations, uh, really excellent um, uh, overview. And, you know, it made me think as well, because frankly, it is a bit surprising that the Dublin regulation is um, finding a place in the current uh, conversation um, regarding legality of the arrangements uh, in Canada, because one will think that the, you know, the notion of mutual trust cannot apply there. I mean, simply, a completely different case where you have a regulation that applies amongst EU member states sharing no internal border controls, mutual recognition of negative asylum decisions, you know, a number of common laws and uh, commitments that do not exist between uh, Canada and the US. I mean, uh, as simple as that, meaning that any reference to the Dublin regulation, I would argue, uh, is flawed. I mean, we, there, we cannot talk about trust there. Uh, as simple as that, mutual trust is, a, uh, as Jens mentioned, uh, the Court of Justice of the EU just popped it up in the jurisprudence. It doesn't ex exist in the treaties. As a principle, uh, mutual trust, it, it, we have mutual recognition, but no mutual trust. And in fact, even that is finding a lot of criticism in scholarship in Europe, criticizing the Court of Justice that you know, this is a notion that basically will not hold. So, but I was generally reflecting on the extent to which we really need to uh, move from the parallelism with the Dublin regulation because of the specificity of that regulation in the EU is simply not applicable to Canada and the US. The US cannot be trusted. I mean, simply it cannot be, as it was mentioned before, the Canadian authorities have the obligation to prove that uh, safety exists. That would be my, my take on this. I now have a question from Joe. So um, here is the question, and I think it's for Prasad, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, it's in regard to the litigation, and um, given the decision by the Federal Court of Appeal, as you mentioned, how significant is the Federal Court's earlier, October 2020, recognition of the harm caused by individuals returned to the USA remain? How, how relevant does that finding remain at present? Um, I'd invite any uh, 
my fellow council team members to weigh in, but to my mind, it's crucially relevant. Um, the record that Justice McDonald examined in detail was quite voluminous. It cataloged in um, sort of <laughs> extreme detail all of the various issues with detention practices in the United States. Um, everything from the likelihood of detention that flows from an ineligibility decision at the US Canadian border, that is the transfer of ineligible refugee claimants from Canadian authorities directly to US authorities, the likelihood of um, detention under conditions that Justice McDonald found uh, to be um, quite abhorrent, the difficulties in refugee claimants actually being able to post bond or obtain parole from detention, um, and then specifically the challenges around asserting refugee claims or asylum claims in the U.S. system while detained. So, for example, there was some affidavit evidence about uh, a woman who was detained who was asserting a gender-based claim, and there were um, tremendous difficulties actually having uh, a professional, a healthcare professional, visit the facility and conduct an examination that was necessary to substantiate that claim. So you can appreciate how... Um, prejudicial something like that can be to, to asserting a, a claim. Um, so that's with respect to detention. With respect to some of the other practices uh, in the U.S. asylum system, so the one-year bar um, and the disproportionate gender impact that that had, again, there was voluminous both expert evidence uh, from scholars in the United States as well as um, lawyers and uh, folks that work for NGOs that really underscored the problems here. So to my mind, it, it's crucial. Um, we hope that the FCA decision is seen as really an aberration. We don't feel that it's consistent with the existing jurisprudence on charter litigation, let alone charter litigation in the context of um, refugee cases. So, so our desperate hope is that the evidentiary record that was put together will really uh, persuade the Supreme Court as it did uh, the federal court. But I, I leave it to, to my colleagues to wait. Thank you, Prasanna. I think, I think that, was, that was well put. Are there any, any other questions in the room? Yes, Colin. Um, so sorry, I haven't been following this yet through country litigation as closely as I ought to, but I was curious about Justice Stratus's theory of how it should brought the case. Would it have even been feasible to challenge the GIC's monitoring decisions? Um, and if not, why not? Well, the, I mean, sorry, I'll get my name again because I'm responsible for this argument. But, um, the, the GIC doesn't make decisions about uh, monitoring. They haven't even considered the issue since 2009. And when, if and when they do, it's all cooked and kept in secrecy. So right. there's there is no decision to which you would have access to reasons right. or a record or anything like that. So like the answer to your question, I think, is no. It right. wouldn't be visible to challenge it. And that's that was one of our arguments. Is that right. That's why it doesn't make any sense. The government has stepped back from the federal court of appeals position on this they oh, they're not even defending it so okay. the case is sort of becoming about something else audrey did you want to ask a question um it, yeah i'd like to build on the question of monitoring and i think this is perhaps directed at, at Jens and, and our european colleagues um given an assumption of mutual trust that is it's predicated on a kind of thick web of um, shared norms, principles, directives that apply to everybody, all the states who are subject to the Dublin regulation. I, I would like to hear more about the monitoring and oversight function in the EU system with respect to uh, the conditions in the countries. And, and maybe I can be clear about this. If there is an assumption of mutual trust, 
does the EU nevertheless monitor actual conditions in countries? And the reason I'm asking is because in Canada, we don't have mutual trust. We don't have all of these agreements in common, all of these qualification directives in common. And so that puts more pressure on monitoring and oversight to see what, what's actually happening in the other state, in this case, the United States. So I, I'd be interested in hearing what goes on in the European uh, context around monitoring and oversight. Thanks. Uh, I see Roberto and Jens. I don't know oh, if they're at both answer the question. Go, go ahead, uh, Professor. Thank you. <clears throat> In principle, the Commission uh, is said to be the, the guardian of the treaties uh, and certainly also of secondary legislation, including the asylum instruments. Uh, and so it is. Uh, we have seen a number of situations in which the, the Commission has sort of uh, stated its concern, expressed its concerns, stated specific criticism against member states. But I think it's a, it's a general experience uh, among observers, uh, civil society observers, NGOs, academics, and so on, that the Commission is is not an efficient uh, and 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 eager guardian uh, in this area. There is a very sort of strongly politicized element in the Commission's uh, performance here, um, because it is you know it is somehow uh, it is probably having considerations as to as to what would be the political costs of uh, bringing <coughs> a specific member state uh, state before the EU Court of Justice as it can uh, in infringement proceedings what would be then the political costs on other uh, in other policy areas so in practice we have seen very few infringement cases uh, Unsurprisingly, there have been uh, at least two, two, two significant cases on asylum procedures concerning or against Hungary. Um, and also sometimes we have seen more general statements from the EU Court of Justice uh, on uh, member states' asylum legislation uh, in cases that were brought from courts in these states, in these member states. Most recently, actually, this summer, there was a, a, a ruling from the Luxembourg Court in which the new um, Lithuanian legislation uh, allowing for uh, essentially for pushbacks to Belarus was was considered in violation of EU law. So so the court sometimes does important things, but of course can only do things it has been requested to do. And I think the Commission is 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 really not a very keen uh, guardian of the treaties. In fact, the Commission has itself in, 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 in recent years admitted that uh, there is a need for more, more strong monitoring. But again, it seems to be sometimes just evaporizing. Thank you. Uh, Roberto or Sergio, is there anything you'd like to add to that? No, we just uh, very much uh, support and love uh, Jen's uh, comments. And indeed, I mean, the key issue there is independence independence and impartiality of uh, the monitoring or any assessment that is being carried out. And in fact, we've also learned that this has been a key uh, question in Europe, um, in particular in, in the context of um, the EU-Turkey statement or deal, so-called EU-Turkey deal, the implementation of it, and the um, preliminary hesitations by the Greek asylum authorities, which were independent then, uh, to send people back to Turkey because, you know, very obvious assessment that Turkey is not safe. And because of the um, political pressures um, from Brussels and the Greek government also take on that authority to change, you know, people who basically attack the independence of the, the independence of that authority to unpoliticize the process. And this is something I think also relevant for our conversation. This thing, and also learned from Rosanna's uh, presentation, who takes the decision? Because if it is not independent and we have the ministry, you know, some ministerial or government, you know, influence, this is basically not qualifiable of any evidence whatsoever. It cannot be meant to be evidence about the safety or unsafety. So um, in our work, we, we've highlighted how crucial it is 
to keep the independence of the asylum authorities and, and, and the assessment, which doesn't exist at the moment at the EU. In fact, the, the revision of the um, European Asylum Support uh, Agency in Malta, which is now uh, called EU Asylum Agency, um, actually provides some powers for the agency to monitor the implementation of the Dublin regulation. And this is, in fact, the only one of the main components that member states agreed not to apply at the moment. Surprise. Thank you so much, Sergio. I, I, is there any, any final questions from the room? Otherwise, we'll, yes, last question, Dana. I didn't want to go earlier. It's not related to council, so I don't want to be selfish. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, just out of curiosity, um, for Professor, um, uh, I I was really struck by that. Um, I think it was a case from 2014, um, from the transfer from Switzerland to Italy, um, where you spoke about like the decision from the court being that the transfer couldn't happen for that Afghan family had Italy provided individual guarantees. And that, if, if I have that right, and that just struck me as a potentially like a, like kind of scary precedent, um, like that could kind of in a worst case scenario, kind of authorize a state to begin to develop some type of two-tiered system to enable transfers like that. So I'm just wondering, since that decision, has there been any type of impact because of that, uh, like positive or negative, that idea of an individual guarantee? May I answer now, uh, Chair? Uh, yes, please. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I, I think the, the Tarak Hill judgment was generally uh, very positively received uh, uh, in, in sort of refugee and human rights uh, uh, circles, so to say, because it, it, it certainly clarified that there is no requirement of systemic flaws uh, as such, because it, it, it sort of brought the Strasbourg court back on track as regards the normal threshold for, for non refoulement uh, assessments, uh, real risk, substantial grounds, as you know. Um, and again, uh, since there were genuine doubts about Italy's uh, abilities to, to, to comply with EU law, it, it was somewhat logical to, to have this requirement of individual guarantees. What happened later on was, uh, on the other hand, that the Strasbourg court sort of watered down this, uh, this uh, the understanding of individual guarantees. Uh, at a certain stage, it accepted a somewhat generalized guarantee that, because at, at a certain point in time in 2015, I think the Italian government said that now we have 168 earmarked places in reception centers for families with children, which is of course not an individual guarantee. So I, I assume that that the, there has been a kind of uh, indirect pressure uh, on the human rights court to accept um, or to refrain from insisting on individual uh, guarantees because they would simply be somewhat incompatible or inoperational under the Dublin system, um, again, because it was already suffering from, from uh, inefficiencies. So I think it has been sort of, we have been in this uh, tension between individual uh, safeguards and, and general operability. Um, and I would, I would say that the individual guarantee was certainly a, 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 a a clear step forward, but it didn't last long, I'm afraid. Thank you. I'm going to ask just one very last question, and then we'll go to break. Um, I understand in recent years, they've there's started to be internal borders set up at certain countries, even within the Schengen zone. We were wondering, because that's a scenario that is similar to the STCA <laughs> context, we were wondering if you know anything about how what is happening at the, when someone tries to claim at an internal border within the EU? I could go first here. Um, uh, to my knowledge, uh, uh, the, 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 the conduct of internal border controls or border checks doesn't really, formally speaking, make any difference because still if, if asylum seekers are uh, are stopped uh, or identified in these border checks <coughs> as they are to a certain extent. That was the whole the whole reason for 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 creating them initially back in 2015-16. Then then that will activate the Dublin regulation, the Dublin system. So it it it's in in one way it can be just seen as as sort of um, 
uh, in one way improving uh, the, 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 uh, the effects of the Dublin uh, responsibility criteria. Uh, I think the, the, the threat against the Dublin system comes from, from other mechanisms. Then there have been some member states uh, which have sort of prepared a kind of suspension of Dublin. Uh, again, unsurprisingly, my own member state, which is in a party to Dublin, but not to the common European asylum system uh, for the rest. Uh, we have actually a, an emergency break. It was a so-called emergency break, which means that in case Dublin collapses, uh, then, then Denmark has prepared legislation so that it can just um, reject asylum seekers on the border and return them to the neighboring countries, that is Germany mostly, uh, sort of shortcutting the Dublin system. Uh, I don't know of other member states that have done this exactly the same. I know Austria has been about to do it. Um, and that may be questionable under EU law, of course, uh, but, but it can be a way of then combining border checks with uh, more, more summary uh, rejections that can ultimately get the, get the nature of pushbacks. Sergio or Roberta, the last word on this? Yes, so just to complement uh, briefly. So indeed, uh, I, I, I fully agree with Jen's reading. And also, I mean, to keep in mind that, um, you know, also the, what Jens mentioned before, I think is really crucial. The European Commission's uh, politicization at times of non-enforcing uh, certain rules. So we've seen it also here, uh, where a few member states reintroduced internal border controls in the name of uh, so-called migration pressures unlawfully um, and the commission has not uh, enforced legal proceedings uh, formal legal proceedings against them despite the calls uh, several calls including the european parliament uh, to bring those governments uh, before justice and for them to apply the rules uh, of uh, internal border control free area um, but also uh, the fact that they haven't provided any evidence on how border controls would help. Because in EU law, border controls must go hand to hand with the right to asylum. So um, there is this very close uh, connection um, as well in, um, in this, uh, in this uh, regard. But this politicization of um, exceptions, and also we know very little what happens at EU internal borders. So there is no uh, a proper monitoring, um, independent monitoring of what and how member states are conducting those that have reintroduced internal border controls, what they are doing precisely, and those who conduct uh, spot checks, police checks, uh, how do they do it? What we know is that uh, research has confirmed that they actually sometimes find a um, problem with uh, racist and discriminatory uh, spot checks. Uh, so some people are checked and not others, but uh, we know very little as well as regards how this is implemented. Thank you. Um, so this, there may be some relevance to the SDC in Europe <laughs> in the future after all. Um, I want to once again extend my thanks to Professor Vesta Hansen and to Prasanna Balasandram for speaking and to everyone for their thoughtful questions and answers. We're going to take a 10 minute break uh, until what is 10.50 Toronto or Eastern Standard Time. Uh, in 10 minutes, we'll resume the second session. Thank you so much.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, welcome to our second uh, panel. And um, for this panel, we are adopting a, a slightly different approach. So um, as part of the Azeal project, Josh and I had the opportunity to uh, provide some information about uh, the Canadian system of uh, both the, rep the asylum system as well as resettlement. Um, and one of the great opportunities or things that I enjoyed about it was that that fed into um, research, direct empirical field work that Roberto Cortinovis uh, did as part of the Azil report um, about Canada. And, and Roberto had the opportunity uh, virtually to meet with a lot of uh, Canadians involved in various aspects of uh, resettlement and complementary pathways, some of whom are here today. And he produced uh, a wonderful report. And if I, if I may say, it is often the case that when somebody who is not from your jurisdiction or country produces a report about you, it becomes this opportunity to see yourself through somebody else's eyes. And it was a complete pleasure to read the report. I enjoyed it a lot and learned a lot from it. And today what we're going to do is allow Roberto to summarize his report uh, and some of the key points in a few minutes. And then we're going to hear commentary, again, well, brief sort of comments from some of the people that Roberto had the opportunity to interview in the preparation of the report. And so I'm just going to introduce them briefly in advance. And then as I moderate the panel, I'll turn to them for their commentary. But let me just uh, in advance uh, introduce in the room here with me, uh, Shauna Labman, who is a professor and program director of human rights at the Global College of the University of Winnipeg. Uh, online, uh, Mustafa Alio, who's the managing director of RSEAT, which stands for Refugees Seeking Equal Access at the Table. Um, that's an international initiative working to enhance the effectiveness of global refugee responses um, and increase the participation of refugees at the state level in meaningful, sustainable, and transformative ways. Uh, we will also hear from Dana Wagner, who's here in the room with us, from Talent Lift, uh, a nonprofit organization assisting employers to source and relocate talent from within refugee populations. So this is a kind of uh, really uh, excellent example of what we refer to as complementary pathways. Uh, also, uh, we will hear from Naomi Albulin, who's online with us today, a senior policy fellow at the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Migration and Integration at, at Toronto Metropolitan University. Uh, and Naomi has extensive experience as both um, a former deputy minister and a policy advisor and analyst for many years. And so with all that, what I'd like to do first is turn it over to Roberto uh, to uh, identify for us some key highlights from his report before uh, handing it to uh, our, our commentators. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Audrey, uh, for your introduction. It's a great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, these sessions on Canada's uh, complementary pathways. Um, and uh, I think that uh, the relevance of today's discussion is not only due to the ambitious targets that and initiatives that have been developed in the framework of the GCR, the Global Compact on Refugees, but it has also been laid bare by uh, state responses to recent uh, displacement emergencies. And Canada's responses to Afghanistan and Ukraine situations are particularly interesting uh, to explore the potential and uh, limitations of different complementary pathways of admission, such as private sponsorship, labor pathways, and uh, extended family reunification. In the remaining part of my introduction, I would like to briefly mention three key issues that confront stakeholders involved in designing and assessing complementary pathways. As you were mentioning, these considerations build on the research on the Canadian system that I and my colleague Andrew Fallon and SEPS have carried out in the framework of the ASIL project. Our work looks specifically at the private sponsorship of refugee program and at Canada's flagship initiative on labor pathways for refugees, the Economic Mobility Pathways Pilot. We are currently working on the final report of this uh, research. So today's panel is a great opportunity indeed for us to gain additional insight from our uh, speakers on some of the main issues addressed in that work. So the first as aspect I would like to mention concerns uh, equitable access and non-discrimination. 
key question here is how to remove those barriers of financial, legal, or informational nature that currently prevent individuals or groups from accessing existing pathways and navigating uh, often complex admission uh, procedures. And uh, in the case of the private sponsorship program, for example, what kind of changes to the regulatory framework, including application procedures and the eligibility criteria could enable more equitable access to diverse uh, refugee populations, both in normal times and in times of mass uh, displacement. Regarding the MPP, the Economic Mobility Pathways Pilot, what revisions but to the existing model uh, would allow deep and access to refugees with different skill, skills levels and across a variety of work sectors. The second issue relates to procedural fairness and access to justice um, that we have also looked uh, in depth in our report. Uh, the fact that complementary pathways, as in the case of the resettlement indeed, are usually framed as discretionary or voluntary practices on the part of states as often prevented to look uh, at these instruments from the, from the, through the lens of the law. A fundamental distinction has been assumed, including in the Canadian context, between the level of procedural protections afforded to asylum seekers who apply within the country and the rights granted to those lodging an application through the overseas system. This implies that, among other things, procedural rights that are commonly considered essential in the context of uh, inland procedures, such as the right to information, legal assistance, and access to effective remedies, are severely limited in the context of overseas refugee decision-making. So a question that I consider worth exploring here is what kind of options are available to strengthen the level of procedural guarantees and establish effective review mechanisms in the context of refugee admission instruments, taking for granted the uh, legal and operational specificities of those channels. Uh, this point brings me quickly to the third issue, uh, which concerns settlement support and its link with refugee agency. The Canadian model uh, counts on a well-established network of state-funded service provider organizations. In addition, sponsored refugees and also EMPP beneficiaries can also rely on the personalized support provided by their sponsors, NGO partners, and volunteer organizations to address uh, specific needs they may face and have access in practice to the rights they are entitled by the law. While this model has proven to bring several benefits, it has also revealed some weaknesses. Uh, for example, excessive dependence of refugees from their sponsors may lead to cases of insufficient support, as well as lack of awareness by newcomers on the range of opportunities available to them in their of education or professional training, for example. So the final question I would like to bring to the discussion is how to strike uh, a right balance between the role and responsibilities of uh, private citizens on the one end and the formal settlement sector uh, on the other. And also how to ensure effective oversight and accountability of the key actors involved to make sure that newcomers receive adequate uh, support. I will leave it there and I, I hope these questions are uh, going to be useful to stimulate the discussion. And I really look forward to the speaker's uh, interventions. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Roberto, uh, for a really crisp, concise uh, summary of, of the report and uh, key questions emerging from it. And so what I'd like to do is just start by turning it over to um, our commentators and uh, invite them to make brief remarks about any aspect of the report or the questions you raised uh, that they find particularly uh, salient or, or relevant. And so let me turn to first to Shauna Lavin, sitting right next to you. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm gonna do a weird thing where I've got my screen on here and then I'm gonna also try and talk to the table because we're in this strange hybrid space. Uh, Roberto and Andrew, this report is remarkably clear, fair and balanced. Uh, and I really appreciate that. It was interesting to speak to Roberto about it and now see the sort of culminating uh, report. I want to start with a comment you make in the first paragraph of the executive summary, because you write that the 2019 UNHCR three-year strategy on resettlement and complementary pathways calls for this growth in complementary pathways with the goal of expanding access through these channels for up to 2 million people by the end of 2028. And you write, this is a target that is double the 1 million resettlement places aimed for during the same period. But the reality is that resettlement targets are never 
close to being met. Um, and this is a fact exasperated by the pandemic, but longstanding. And it's um, leading to what an MPI report from October 2021 labels the resettlement gap. And in that report, it's pointed out that overall, the global refugee population has approximately doubled since 2011, with projected resettlement needs increasing by nearly 80%. Yet over the same period, the number of individuals who've been resettled shrunk by more than half. So this is in itself the argument in favor of complementary pathways to find new routes to bring people to protection. Uh, but in another recent report by Refugee Point titled Preserving the Humanitarian Nature of Resettlement, those authors caution that it's important that we understand and grapple with the degree to which various complementary pathways actually complement resettlement and the degree to which many of them compete with it instead. And I think this is important to focus on, particularly as your report looks so closely at this question of vulnerability. So you recognize in the report that neither the AMPP or PSR, the private sponsorship program, envisage a specific focus on this question of vulnerability at the selection stage. And you suggest that this is not in principle a concern because of our alternative admission channel of resettlement, which is so closely focused on vulnerability. But then you go on to note that the trend towards increased private sponsorship over government resettlement in Canada casts a doubt on the commitment by the Canadian government to stick to the principle of additionality and ensure a balance between the two mainstreams in its resettlement programs. So this is the idea of private sponsorship is additional to government resettlement. And what I would raise here is that it's actually a question for me if the Canadian government even endorses the principle of additionality. So if I go back to uh, 2016 IRCC, the Immigration Refugee Citizenship Canada evaluation of Canada's three resettlement programs, they actually note in that report, the principle of additionality is not part of the PSR program theory. And I haven't really found any counter, counters to that from the messaging of the government. For private sponsors themselves, of course, additionality as well as naming, uh, which is also discussed in the report, are the core principles of private sponsorship. But I'm not sure that's reflected in the government assessment of the program. And in the report, it's noted that even where there are, quote, formal commitments taken by states to ensure additionality, Existing research underlines how some national governments are effectively substituting their resettlement pledges with pledges in these complementary pathways. And your report notes that over the last few years, sponsored refugees have begun to greatly outnumber government resettled refugees in Canada, signaling a possible shift to greater privatization. And added to this, I would note that in Canada's 2021 federal election, the Conservative Party of Canada, in fact, proposed in their election platform to, quote, replace public government-assisted refugee places with more private and joint sponsorship places. So I think these are real flags and real concerns. And while the report nods to this, it's necessary to remember that the question is not just how these programs offer complementary pathways, but whether they sustain or draw away from the traditional pathways. And by the traditional pathways, I want to talk about resettlement, but also nodding back to our first panel, the question of asylum routes. Uh, so the report acknowledges the potential transfer of the PSR program to countries that don't present the same legal, institutional, or political conditions similar to Canada. But what's not really discussed in the report is the different circumstances of asylum flows in those countries that trigger their interest in sponsorship models compared to the realities in Canada and the historical development of the sponsorship program. So the question, and this is of course where much of my own work centers, is on how resettlement itself relates to asylum and then how the complementary pathways play into this or exasperate the problems. On the discussion of asylum, the report does note the tension between Canada's restrictive approach towards spontaneous arrival and the role of the country as being recognized as a champion of refugee resettlement. And that, of course, comes from an earlier report that Josh and Audrey wrote. Uh, but I think it's important not just to see this tension, but to understand how these tensions interlink, this tension between asylum and resettlement. 
So Jamie Liu and I have framed this in a 2019 article as the idea of moral licensing, whereby curtailing access to asylum can be justified because Canada has seemingly done its part in resettling thousands of overseas refugees. And your report notes the self-perceived identity of Canada as a quote, country of immigration. But I'd highlight that Canada also tends to position itself, and we see this in IRPA, um, in its refugee response as part of a humanitarian tradition. And it really takes pride, the government takes pride in presenting itself with this professed humanitarian identity. Yet as the report notes, both the PSR and the EMPP programs stretch into Canada's other immigration pathways. So the PSR program can serve to address the limitations in our family class for family reunification beyond the nuclear family. And the EMPP is itself actually situated within the economic class of admissions. And yet the gross majority of immigration admissions to Canada already come through the economic and family classes with the humanitarian stream being the smallest. So again, this both explains the incentive towards complementary pathways, but also triggers some concern. Uh, so those were the sort of main things I wanted to raise. I'm gonna, I have all sorts of other things, Roberta, that I'd just love to discuss with you after. I have a final sort of observation and question, and this has been lingering with me for a while now. Uh, the report is premised on this framing in the Global Compact on Refugees that sees private sponsorship of refugees and the EMPP as complementary pathways. But the PSR program uh, precedes this new language of complementary pathways by over 40 years and has always been conceived in the Canadian um, understanding as a component of our refugee resettlement. And so one thing I'm sort of struggling with in some of my current writing is what are the distinct benefits of understanding private sponsorship as resettlement? And is anything lost if we shift the understanding of sponsorship into a complementary pathway outside of resettlement? So I'll leave it with that. And thank you so much for the report. I really enjoyed reading it. Thanks so much, Shauna, um, for great kind of insightful observations and questions arising from uh, Roberto's report. Um, and you touched on um, different dimensions of the report. Um, I, I was going to go next to Mustafa Alio, but it looks like we might have lost him. So if I am right about that, I don't see him on screen. I am going to um, instead um, turn to Dana um, to talk about uh, particularly, I think, the work that you do on some a facet of what's called the EMPP um, talent lift, and I'll just hand it over to you. Wonderful. I'm going to see if I can do this as well as Sean just did it. <laughs> With the video. And, okay, great. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much, Audrey, and thanks, Audrey and Josh, for organizing this great um, workshop. I The morning session was totally outside of my um, yeah, experience and knowledge area. So I really found this very useful. Um, and I'll just reiterate, yeah, Roberto, this was a, and Sergio, this was an excellent report. Um, I totally agree with Audrey. You really see yourself and, and what's happening in your country from a very different lens uh, when someone's writing about it. So uh, thank you for this. Again, really clear picture of some uh, kind of tricky programs to unpack, at least uh, to unpack at least the EMPP. There's not been a ton um, publicly reported on it yet. Um, so I will focus my uh, comments just on the kind of um, future focused um, uh, direction. And I, again, I really like how the report is kind of framed around how do we support the development of the EMPP, but also the potential transfer um, of it to other countries. So um, I will just kind of focus some thoughts around the principle of equity. And I should also, sorry, before I dive into that, I'll just, um, uh, because I think our organization talent is quite new. So I should have properly introduced myself <laughs> as our co-founder and managing director. Um, so Talent is a nonprofit international recruitment agency. So we work with companies across Canada. Uh, we do recruitment and relocation, and we're really styled after a, um, a for-profit recruitment agency, although we're nonprofit. Um, so we're nonprofit because we're very mission driven. We work exclusively with candidates who are living in refugee populations in different parts of the world. Um, but we're modeled after um, kind of uh, what we hope to be, um, you know, uh, we, we want to model ourselves up after the for-profit 
um, services because we think that that is part of raising the competitiveness of our candidates. If we can provide services similar to other international recruitment agencies that are not working with this population group. So in-house, we do talent search, visa applications through in-house legal counsel and settlement and relocation coordination. Um, we are also supporting an NGO of the EMPP working with IRCC. So there's a select group of now of six NGOs supporting um, implementation of the EMPP. Um, and we have some really interesting uh, operational pilots in different parts of the world to actually identify candidates, including the UNHCR, um, certain country offices, uh, and, and other NGOs that we work with. That said, just a nutshell view of us. Um, so yeah, back to the, the um, thoughts that I'll provide just on the, the principle of equity. So in my view, in skilled immigration as a complementary pathway, um, equity should really be as central in our analysis and our framing as the principle of protection, which I think the report did cover very well. Um, and this is just because equity really helps to inform, uh, yeah, just, just kind of many different components of analysis and, and, and measuring um, in this context. So um, what I mean by that, first of all, I think that equity can really inform how we measure success in, in this work. Um, so in skilled immigration as a complementary pathway, amazingly, we have a control group, which is skilled immigration, immigrants from any other background, not just the population that we're working with, talented folks from refugee circumstances. Um, so for example, one measure of success that I think we should hold ourselves to is the ease and the scale of skilled immigration to Canada by people from any other background. And by this measure, the EMPP has a lot, a lot, a lot of room to improve. So it's really more rightly viewed at this point as an extremely narrow, cautious, proof of concept pilot. And I argue it's still very much in this phase. And we don't yet really have a realistic plan um, from government for how to scale it. Um, Second, I think equity can really inform also how we think about protection. So what does protection mean in the context of skilled immigration to Canada? And I would um, cautious, I, I, I picked it up a few times in the report, which I, and I think it's a, a kind of a function of having, um, again, to this point of do we, does PSR and skilled immigration belong, belong together in, our, in an analysis? I'm not sure, but um, I, I think that, uh, I, I just want to caution about um, a bias uh, in, terms of preferencing permanent residents over entry on temporary residents. So this is a big recurring theme for me um, and, and our organization. Um, so, you know, just for example, on page seven of the report, um, it, we talk about that, uh, there's just a phrase that goes, um, the EMPP beneficiaries are granted permanent resident status in Canada, which implies that they benefit from the security of status and a generous set of rights associated with PR. Um, I argue that temporary residence also carries security of status and a generous set of rights. So think about temporary residence in Canada. Um, and the reason I'm focusing really on this is because again, the EMPP doesn't apply to TR right now. It only allows entry on, on permanent residence. So the flexibility of the EMPP is really, is only focused on a, a subset of care pathways. So TR in Canada actually provides again, um, access to the rule of law, access to public health care, access to public education for kids, pathways to permanent residence and pathways to citizenship. Um, for the unconvinced about this being a secure status, I'll just note that UNHCR does support temporary residence um, and a durable solution itself is agnostic of PR versus TR. A durable solution is access ultimately to citizenship. Um, for the further unconvinced, I will just note that um, without blinking, Canada decided that any risk of temporary residence in this country is outweighed in the case of Ukrainians by the value, the humanitarian and the economic value of getting people here very quickly. And I believe that was absolutely the correct decision and one that should be a precedent for the EMPP and scaling the EMPP. Um, and if anyone is still unconvinced, I would just encourage you um, speaking to someone living in a place, of course, you know, where they're facing whatever they're facing, but the one that, um, you know, is just consistently heartbreaking is living in a place where you can't send your kids to school and asking them, would you rather have a narrow shot at permanent residence in Canada, or would you rather have a much larger shot at temporary residence in Canada and, and the pathway of permanent residence that follows? And you're going to get the second answer every time. Um, and again, the equity lens here matters because temporary residence, we consider that a good status in Canada. 
um, for everyone else. It's not perfect, but we consider it good um, for a lot of people, again, workers, students, et cetera. Um, so we just have to face up to what that means. We're arguing for a different standard for people from refugee circumstances. That again, just means a much smaller group of people are gonna be allowed in with a gold standard instead of a much larger group of people on a good standard. Um, and that brings me finally to just um, equity uh, informing how we think about scale in this work and in this pilot in particular. So um, again, after all, the three-year strategy, I think is really a scale challenge. I think about 2 million people on CP is double the, the 1 million resettlement by 2028. Um, and it, so let me just share the numbers that we're at right now in the ENPP. So um, we're in the second phase of the pilot, which began in December, 2021. And that as of May 31st, so six months on, we have 22 applications. Okay, so there are 49 people, or basically 50 people with job offers over a six month period. And that's with six NGOs supporting this work. Um, 50 people with job offers and 22 applications. It's tiny, <laughs> it's so, so, so tiny. And that's in an economy, of course, we know there's more than 1 million vacancies in Canada right now, 75% of our members <coughs> reporting they can't find the skills that they need. Um, and a really important reference point, again, if you're thinking from an equity lens, what does this look like for everyone else? In the year before the pandemic, Canada issued over 400,000 work permits. That's the opportunity space, right? So we've had 22 applications um, under the ENPP. Um, and so why such meager results? Um, again, this is because people who are refugees under this pilot have a different and lower level of access. So the EMPP only applies to a narrow group of permanent residence pathways only, not temporary residence pathways. And that means that they have very, very lengthy timelines compared to applicants from any other background. And therefore fewer employers in Canada are actually able or willing to hire people um, if they're only allowed on these, these, this narrow group of peer pathways. So again, this just has to be understood as a massive trade-off in scale. Um, so my colleagues and I at Townlift um, and some other um, colleagues of ours at different NGOs really want to see the EMPP shift into something a lot broader and a lot more nimble. Um, and there's really straightforward administrative flexibility that can be applied to do that. Um, so just for information, we, are, uh, we looked at um, or tried to assess um, the changes that would be needed if we tried to make the fewest changes possible um, with the fewest resources. And we ended up highlighting or finding four administrative waivers only, four waivers that would basically allow people from refugee backgrounds to apply to any of Canada's permanent and temporary uh, economic pathways. Um, and they all have precedents actually in practice, either from the EMPP, the, the um, Emergency Authorization for Ukrainians, um, or for in the case of uh, if there's an administrative change we want to see the BCAs, which is in practice um, recognized by different regulatory bodies across Canada, but not yet in, in our immigration program. So um, I'll leave it there and not actually get into what more specifics of what those waivers are. I think that was all of my time. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, and I think you've also put a lot of provocative questions on the table and I'm struck as I'm sure will be true of our next speakers, have both, both you and Shauna point out how the kinds of questions that are considered in this report are inextricable from larger questions that we pose about migration regimes. And they become microcosms of larger unresolved dilemmas. Um, so let me now turn it over um, to uh, Naomi Albuem. Um, I'm holding a place here for Mustafa if he is either there or comes back, but I don't I don't see him on the list. So uh, Naomi, um, I'd like to open the floor to you. So okay, I think can you hear me now? Yes, good. Okay. Um, so thanks, Audrey, and uh, thanks for inviting me and. Um, uh, thanks for giving me this uh, this opportunity. Um, I want to give kudos, as others have, to Roberto for pulling together his paper on uh, complementary pathways used in Canada. Um, I debated whether I wanted to do a kind of um, uh, critique or um, analysis of that paper. Uh, the way Shauna has done and uh, to or to add specific things the way uh, Dana has done. And instead, I chose to do something totally different, which I hope will be okay. 
And that's basically um, to talk about complementary pathways as avenues for public participation and awareness, which I believe are really key elements for contributing to successful refugee movements. So as Audrey mentioned in her introduction, I've been involved in a variety of capacities in four of the major refugee movements that have come to Canada, the Indo-Chinese, the Syrian, the Afghan, and the Ukrainian, although the Ukrainian one is not technically a refugee movement. Each has had its own complexities and challenges, but I believe the refugee movements that have been most successful um, when three elements are present government leadership, media coverage, and for the purposes of this conversation, public participation. These three elements are interconnected. They interact and form a virtual circle. Government leadership is exemplified when it leads not only in its discourse, but in, in its actions. This includes demonstrating a strong and sustained commitment creating and implementing responsive and effective policies, programs, and vehicles for public participation, providing transparent information about progress and challenges to the media and the public, and by working in partnership with other levels of government, the private sector, and civil society to ensure public support. The media has the greatest impact when it galvanizes public awareness about the refugee situation abroad and what is happening on the ground in Canada to assist refugees. This in turn strengthens government commitment and public participation. The media can also play an important role by maintaining a critical eye on government responses and keeping the public informed about what is happening, why and how to become involved. This will keep the issue on the front burner. Public participation means that civil society, the private sector, and individual Canadians are meaningfully engaged in various ways. Partnerships and civil society organizations can help to shape and implement refugee policies, programs, and vehicles for public participation. The private sector can provide employment, goods, services, and financial donations, and individual Canadians make an enormous contribution by serving as private sponsors and volunteers, forming important, important connections with refugees, and becoming advocates for them and their families. In short, an engaged and committed public can spur the government to exercise stronger leadership and action, and this in turn will motivate continued public engagement for the benefit of refugees. That is why private sponsorship and the EMPP, if it grows significantly, and other potential complementary pathways like student refugee programs are so important. The more awareness and engagement, the more public support and the more governments are prepared to do. We saw this in the Indo-Chinese and Syrian refugee movements through the extensive and successful use of the private sponsorship program and concomitant increases to the number of government assisted refugees admitted as a result of public pressure. Government demonstrated policy leadership by eliminating the requirement for individual refugee status determinations in both the Indo-Chinese and Syrian cases. In the Indo-Chinese case, extended families were selected beyond the normal family definition in order to resettle whole families together. And a voluntary departure program directly from Vietnam was introduced for family reunification purposes. The joint assistance program was used for the admission of extremely vulnerable refugees. In the Syrian example, the government initially imposed no ceiling for private sponsored refugees, which provided a real incentive for people to become sponsors. When the overall target of 25,000 was met for all Syrian refugees, and the government did impose a cap on the number of sponsorship applications that could be submitted, there was outrage from the public and the cap was removed, resulting in a rise of admissions to 40,000 by the end of 2020. This included extensive use of the sponsorship program 
for family reunification. In both the Indo-Chinese and Syrian cases, government leaders regularly briefed the media and there was continuous and extensive media coverage. This sustained public awareness and support for the movement. I would argue, however, that the Afghan and Ukrainian movements are both facing significant challenges in each of the spheres of government leadership, media coverage, and public participation. In the Afghan situation, the federal government made announcements of its very good intentions with little capacity to deliver on the ground, given no Canadian military, diplomatic, or immigration presence in Afghanistan, and the enormous challenges there and in neighboring countries. It was slow in removing people from Afghanistan, slow in responding to inquiries from Afghans, slow in moving people from neighboring, neighboring countries to Canada. There has been little visible effort by the federal government to keep the public, stakeholders, and the media apprised of the challenges being faced or progress being made, and little sustained media coverage as a result. Perhaps most importantly, there are few avenues for public participation in sponsorship or real public engagement. Referrals of refugees can only be made by the UNHCR, the United States, the Department of National Defense, Global Affairs Canada, and designated human rights organizations. The private sponsorship route remains virtually blocked for those affected by the recent Taliban takeover. There is a huge backlog in sponsorship applications for refugees from other parts of the world, of other parts of the world, and only a few additional new refugee spaces for Afghans were allocated to sponsorship agreement holders late in the process for new sponsorships. Afghans sponsored by groups of five require individual refugee status determinations, which are extremely difficult, if not impossible, to get in most neighboring countries to which Afghans escaped. This also closes the one avenue that was available for family reunification. The government has given no indication of developing a family unification program for Afghans other than for family members of former Afghan interpreters already in Canada. The lack of sponsorship opportunities across the country also means that government-assisted Afghan refugees are concentrating in major urban centers facing housing crises, service pressures, a higher cost of living, and without the wraparound supports, social networks, and advocacy of their sponsors. This has also meant that there is a smaller cadre of aware, engaged Canadians to advocate for increased and quicker government action. In the, Ukraini <clears throat> in the Ukrainian case, the government demonstrated strong leadership by acting very swiftly and creatively to respond to the invasion by Russia. Ukrainians are eligible to receive emergency travel authorizations, to work or study in Canada as temporary residents, to stay for three years or more and to receive priority processing to become permanent residents. There is no cap to their arrivals and they determine where and when they settle. The government has also promised to develop a family unification program for both immediate and extended family members. However, the government did not think through the implications of considering them as temporary entrants and not refugees. As such, they are not eligible for all the supports and services available to refugees. And this has led to the development of parallel systems, lower benefits, a heavy reliance, perhaps others would call it a downloading on provincial and municipal governments, the private sector and the Ukrainian Canadian Congress and consistencies across the country. Another major downside is that as non-refugees, they are ineligible for private sponsorship, which drastically reduces opportunities for public participation and the personal connections so vital to successful two-way integration for the Ukrainians and the Canadian public. It also prevents members of the general public from having an inside view of what's working and what's not and to raise any concerns. Despite these issues, the media has been largely sympathetic 
because of their ongoing coverage of the war in Ukraine. However, many have questioned the differential treatment offered to Ukrainians as opposed to refugees from Afghanistan and other parts of the world. The stark contrast between the policy choices made by the current government on two simultaneous refugee movements to Canada and on previous ones gives us the opportunity to assess government leadership, the role of the media, and public participation as key elements in achieving success. In my view, complementary pathways like private sponsorship may in fact be a critical part of any successful refugee movement to ensure broad public support and responsive government leadership and not just a nice to have add on. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naomi. Um, and I know Naomi and I have both been talking about the Afghan situation for some time now in comparison to the Ukrainian, um, the response of the Canadian government to Ukraine. It's, it's great to hear this kind of really succinct and incisive kind of critique of what is in fact happening on the ground. What I, I'd like to do is uh, first put it back to Roberto to provide any feedback. And before I do that, let me also acknowledge, as I should have at the outset, that, is that this report is co-authored the, with uh, Andrew Fallon. And I, when I you know, express my appreciation and admiration for all the work in the report, uh, please understand that that's extended to Andrew as well, of course. And uh, as I turn it back to Roberto for comments, of course, it's also uh, to Andrew as well for any comments and feedback to those who have already provided their um, their observations. So over to you guys, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Audrey, and uh, it's great that Andrew uh, has joined us because it, he has worked uh, a lot on this report with me, specifically on the EMPP. So um, it's great to have also him in this conversation. I would like to thank all the, the speakers for their interventions, for uh, the great contribution really that uh, they, they made that, uh, they made to our research. And uh, as I said in the introduction, we are working now on the final version of the report, so we will work um, to, to take into account uh, this, this, um, these comments and dif these different perspectives to, to enrich uh, our, our, um, our discussion. Um, on the issue of, um, of uh, um, the way the, 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 the role of, uh, of, comp of uh, private sponsorship and the need to look uh, not only at the relation with, with uh, state-led resettlement, but broadly, to the overall asylum uh, system that was mentioned by by Shona, I I, I, I completely uh, I completely agree on uh, on this, and uh, the link is uh, I think it should be stressed more in our report that uh, how the the way um, private sponsorship has been framed in relation to asylum in a way to to in a way delegitimize uh, asylum. Uh, spontaneous asylum application or to in a way create the, 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 the space for restrictive approaches there uh, um, because of the role that was assigned to, to to private sponsorship I think this is a, this is a key aspect and uh, and uh, we will uh, we will um, focus on this more uh, uh, in, in, in the first part of, of the report in the final uh, final version um, concerning the um, categorization of, of um, private sponsorship as, as a, as a complementary uh, pathways uh, uh, our starting point here was to look uh, what was was to look at debates uh, within the context of uh, the GCR the global compact initiatives and UNACR uh, formal uh, uh, categorization uh, on this, which sees uh, private sponsorship as a, the complementary nature of private sponsorship is linked to the fact that um, private actors, sponsors are, um, are allowed to name, are given the possibility to name, um, to name uh, specific individuals uh, for for admission, and this is uh, indeed what what makes makes private sponsorship under this uh, interpretation as uh, 
uh, as as a complementary uh, as a complementary pathway in um, in uh, in opposition, for example, to to other uh, instruments where uh, private actors are uh, supporting people who are uh, referred by UNHCR or um, through but, but that have already been identified by by national authorities. The fact is that uh, as soon as you start looking into, into the Canadian system, you see how this distinction distinction get, uh, get blurred. You see that private sponsorship in Canada is a much more complex, uh, I would say, landscape, uh, and it does not fit with this uh, clear-cut categorization. So this, 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 this com let's say, I would say this complexity um, is, is something that um, we will try to, to, to stress more in our report, because I think it's also relevant when uh, when when similar uh, discussions, when similar debates are um, are carried out in in Europe, to 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 to, to be clear about what we what we understand, what's our understanding of uh, of private sponsorship, and uh, what are the options available, and with our different implications also for government uh, looking at different uh, different uh, pathways or different uh, channels. I would like also to thank uh, um, uh, Naomi for, for uh, her very rich uh, interventions uh, and for uh, outlining what are uh, the key, I would say, ingredients for, uh, for um, private sponsorship to, to, to succeed, to, to meet uh, the expectations, building on, on, uh, on several previous experiences of um, of the Canadian uh, history in this in this uh, in this field, and also for a very rich uh, um, discussion on the current uh, two main situations: Afghanistan and and uh, and uh, and Ukraine. And in this regard, if I may close with uh, with a question back to to our speakers, uh, um, it was mentioned the completely different, or I would say, um, unexpected or unprecedented, better approach uh, of uh, that the Canadian government took to the Ukrainian situation and uh, we had similar debates in Europe and we have been wondering in Europe uh, if this, uh, this, um, uh, this experience is going to change also future responses to other, to other, uh, to other uh, um, displacement situations. Uh, now we mentioned very well that there are pros and cons, there are many positive aspects, other aspects are still left uh, not completely uh, clear uh, what are the implications of this approach. So I would like to um, ask you uh, if you think this, uh, this, uh, this new model based on uh, temporary uh, protection in light also of what uh, Dana was mentioning about the potential of temporary residence for, for refugee admission uh, would also change the future uh, approach and also, also and also in light of the fact that that was mentioned private sponsorship was not working has not met the expectations so far so far very well in the case of the Afghanistan uh, response. Uh, I would like to, to ask uh, Andrew if uh, he would like to, to comment on, uh, on on the speaker's uh, interventions. Yes, thank you Roberto for that comprehensive overview and thank you also to all the speakers for their insights. Uh, it's really a pleasure to hear such experts in the field discuss uh, Roberto and my work together in the last months. I think the, you know, first I want to thank specifically uh, and reiterate Dana's point that you know, it is difficult to make a comparison between the um, private sponsorship of refugees program and the EMPP, given that one is incredibly nascent, nascent and the other that has a four decade history of implementation. And yet then I think that this comparison provides us an interesting opportunity to then look at the ways in which we can see these policy instruments develop and hopefully aim, or as they continue to develop, to increase the equitable accessibility, both procedurally and in implementation of these pathways. With that then, I think that there's two especially interesting elements that uh, came from the speaker's comments. The first element, is in regard to the idea of additionality and how complementary pathways are, as we discussed in the paper, intended to be additional, but also it seems intended to be expanding far beyond even state-led resettlement. And with this, then, we can see uh, first with the private sponsorship of refugees, as we discuss, the way in which 
in some capacities, this approach to additionality can, or perhaps even over-reliance on additionality, can uh, engender state responses that then create sort of de facto uh, reliance on complementary pathways. Specifically in regard to family resettlement, we can see then that instruments like uh, the uh, private sponsorship end up serving in place of a fully functioning family resettlement system based on the differential uh, accessibility of the instruments. And indeed then, this goes to a second idea, which is attractiveness. And this is something that Sergio has also written about earlier. And I would go back to then his earlier writing on attractiveness in discussing the policy framework in the EU context, saying that the rationale between this fragmented policy approach was uh, in fact driven by the attractiveness and selective policy paradigm to attract categories of third country nationals who are deemed to be in need. And this is in the context of labor pathways specifically, but also with complementary pathways, we can see that individuals who either have uh, the support of sponsorship agreement holders or groups of five benefit from a sort of uh, additional attractiveness, given that then they're perceived to not require the same levels of support. And this, especially in terms of family unification, is something that can then create differences in who can and can't access these instruments. This then requires deeper reflection on how we can balance the role of the state with pathways that are framed as additional to these core responsibilities of the state. The second then goes to the EMPP and the idea of attractiveness in that with uh, implementing partners such as Refuge Point and Talent Beyond Boundaries, much as de jure, all individuals may have equitable access to this. And indeed, we can see that even with phase two of the EMPP's implementation, very encouraging steps taken, such as uh, those that seek to enable individuals who do not have valid travel documents, but do have then a person of interest letter provided, can now have access to the program. Or similarly, individuals uh, who may not have had the financial ability to qualify for the different pathways through which the EMPP operates the pre-existing labor migration pathways, then being granted access to loans that were available to other resettled uh, refugees. This then shows uh, progress towards expanding the accessibility. And yet this on the de jure level sometimes differs from the de facto level where organizations such as Talent Beyond Boundaries Refuge Point through no fault of their own may perhaps have uh, systems that preference individuals with certain levels of human capital. This means that individuals who have previously participated in uh, vocational training programs, who then would be known to organizations, may uh, be more able to access a program like the EMPP. And individuals who have less need for vocational programs, perhaps given that their skills were already uh, advanced or pre-existing, but also may lack documentation of those skills, may face de facto barriers to accessibility. And this is something that then we can see changing over time. And we hope to then continue to see the evolution of in the future. So the way in which then the uh, framing of complementary pathways as additional intersects with then the policy paradigm of attractiveness is something that will continue to be, uh, I think, an important area of research for the future. And I really am grateful for all of the contributions made by the panelists today. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Roberto, I see your hand is still up, but is that a, an old hand, as it were, a legacy hand? <laughs> okay. Um, okay, um, I see questions. I'm not sure if it is or not, but I'm gonna start with others and circle back to you, if that's okay. Uh, start with Jens, and then I see Naomi, and then back to Roberto and Sergio. Jens, go ahead. Thank you, um, Audrey. I I'm not quite sure how to how to uh, um, wind this up. Maybe I should uh, mention a few things uh, I didn't have time to do in my initial presentation. That is the ongoing the ongoing um, uh, process of um, of uh, revision of uh, the Dublin uh, regulation. Would that make sense uh, in, in, in the chair's plans for the, for the discussion? I think that we might want to focus right now on um, Roberto and Andrew's uh, paper and the interventions in response to them. 
But I know, I am sure, I speak for all of the council in the room and everybody else in the room that we would in fact be interested in hearing about it. Um, could I suggest that we hold off until the end and then decide whether people can stay for that or we can arrange for another kind of way of, of communicating that? That sounds good, Ori. Thank you for clarifying. I'll refrain from now then. Um, um, I just wanted to respond to Roberto's question about um, whether the experience with Ukraine can, um, you know, do we see the possibility of some of the innovations with this response going forward to other refugee movements? Um, I mean, I think that we've learned a lot um, uh, from the various um, uh, refugee movements and how Canada has dealt with them. I think, ideally, when we're talking about a refugee stream, and not necessarily a labor mobility stream, but if we're talking about a refugee stream, um, I think getting, you know, sort of borrowing the best from, from each of the movements, um, would be ideal. And I, I would see, and this is something that the CCR has spoken about and others have spoken about, the speed with which the Ukrainian thing was put into place is extraordinary. And if we can re repeat that for other, you know, real crisis situations, that would be great. The level of services that are generally provided to resettled refugees should be part and parcel, not like what is happening with the Ukraine with the Ukrainian flow, but to have a kind of standard level of support and um, access to services. And I would add um, a dedicated refugee family reunification stream. Um, that goes beyond the narrow definition of family and beyond the current one year window approach. If every refugee movement that Canada responds to has those three components, speed, full access to services and a family reunification component, I think um, we would uh, have a real winner here, if you like, in terms of responding to the needs of both the individuals and uh, the situations as a whole. Whether that will happen or not in future, um, who knows? Um, there were particular circumstances, obviously, around the Ukrainian situation. I think in terms of the um, EMPP, and Dana has, has certainly heard me talk about this before, and we've conferred and uh, on some of these issues, I think one way to approach the EMPP in order to scale it um, is number one, to look at a cluster approach rather than an individual by individual approach and look at a sector or look at a geographic community, geographic area with groups of employers working together, but to bring in a cluster of refugees um, uh, together to go beyond the highly skilled and to go uh, towards refugees who have skills, but not necessarily those that are uh, require really high human capital. Um, I think that would be really useful. And I would say, looking at all the employers who currently are bringing in so many temporary foreign workers, um, and really working with them and making it a kind of quid pro quo. You cannot bring in temporary foreign workers without looking at potential refugees with uh, ability to contribute to the workforce. And to, um, I mean, we are bringing in so many temporary foreign workers. Um, uh, uh, surely there are employers, if, if the administrative problems can be sorted out, who would be willing to um, and ready to uh, hire refugees instead of temporary foreign workers. However, I disagree with Dana in terms of what the ultimate um, uh, status would be. Um, I really do think that we need to expedite refugees coming in on the labor stream, ref expedite the process, but bring them here already either as permanent residents or on TRPs, temporary resident permits, on the understanding that they will be transitioned to permanent residence practically upon arrival. 
the way we did do with a lot of the Afghan refugees who had to be airlifted and come, you know, really quickly. They came on TRPs and they were processed to PR from within Canada. So I think bring them in temporarily to expedite their arrival, but with the goal of transitioning to PR as fast as possible um, within the country. Thank you. Um, um, Jens, did you want to pose a question about this uh, topic? Okay, um, I'm going to go over to uh, somebody in the room. No, with a hand up. No. Okay, uh, Shauna. Okay, I'll do this again both ways. Uh, too many things to say. Uh, I think I would agree with Naomi's final point about the need. Uh, for eventual permanent residents. Um, and Dana, you made the really great analogy about the preference of the person of, of course, is uh, the immediate temporary solution. But I think the problem is it's also the preference of the government. And so that we then lose the gold standard of any permanent residence when we open ourselves to too much temporary. Um, but one of the things that I found really interesting, uh, I've been doing work with the uh, Manitoba government and actually trying to encourage them to do more EMPP and be open to it. Um, and they seem to have this sense that there's too much additional support required on these arrivals, which is creating a reluctance. Uh, and yet at the same time, the ease with which the gaps in employment that are being filled by Ukrainians and those from Hong Kong who also have easier access to visas to get to Canada quicker, the government is taking immense advantage of because they can locate them. And so, so many of those temporary spots are going where these, the federal government has already facilitated the temporary visa. So on one side, you do see that sort of arrival that from the provincial interests then makes it easier to welcome people. So I feel really kind of conflicted in these two things. Uh, the other thing I'm working really strongly on at the University of Winnipeg right now is the Scholar at Risk program to try and bring uh, a scholar to the university, and that is another temporary model. So we have, in addition to the MPP, the Scholar at Risk program, which brings academics for temporary appointments to universities. There's also the Artists, um, Artist Protection Fund, which brings artists for temporary locations in different places. So there are these differing models. And I think the question I wanted to ask back to Dana is how much do these sort of models align with each other and do you work together on these sort of ideas? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, I think that I think we don't link these issues as much as we should. Just recently, we started chatting with like the folks at WUSC, for example, and UNHCR about um, basically the um, how outdated temporary intent is for all workers and all students. You know, temporary intent and that requirement to demonstrate that you can leave Canada at the end of your stay is really, I believe, from a time where Canada had not really made the determination that we would actually indeed prefer to have these folks stay here permanently. I, I know I'm, I'm simplifying there that there's not the same um, uh, availability of permanent residence pathways for folks in lower level, lower level in quotes, um, occupations, but certainly for students and, and for other international workers, we really do prefer them to stay through to permanent residence pathways. So, you know, there's um, certainly uh, opinions in the legal community that that should just be swept away for all folks arriving on um, work permits and student permits. And really it, it belongs that ability to, or to demonstrate temporary intent and visitor visas, right? Those are the folks where we're letting you in temporarily or asking to come temporarily and then we, we want to see you leave again. Um, and so I, I do think we could be linking these policy issues a lot more closely. I, I don't know as much as I should about the scholar service program and like how much we could be kind of learning from and, and building on kind of shared challenges um, or successes there. Um, I just want to quickly respond also to Naomi's um, uh, really, you know, and again, really thoughtful critiques about the temporary residence model and, and availability of permanent residence after arrival. One of the things that our organization has recommended to government is for some assurance about an availability of a permanent residence pathway is that you could waive temporary intent for folks who are coming in with a job offer, um, uh, you know, a job act work permit who can demonstrate a transition plan to permanent residence. And that basically will um, 
it's it's basically a a, a a way to build the model, Naomi, that you just stated, where you allow folks quickly on, on temporary if they can transition to permanence. That's what we're asking for. It's just in this model, it is you know using the system that all other workers are using, where you arrive first probably on an LMI back work, work permit. And in some cases with a provincial nomination and then a work permit while, you know, before your, your permanent residence is, is processed. But I, I, I certainly believe that Canada has a lot more work to do with, um, you know, expanding permanent residence options for not C and D occupations. That's a real big gap right now, but that's one way that we could address it. Say, sure, temporary resident will let you in if you're from refugee circumstances, but because you're from those circumstances, we'll ask you for the additional assurance of a transition plan to PR. Thank you. I, I'm going to um, exploit my position, um, knowing that we're coming to the end. If I can just make a couple of interventions, I will then turn it over to um, Roberto and Andrew for the last word. And then, for those who are able to stay uh, for a brief conversation with Jens about uh, matters relating to the first uh, panel, everybody's welcome to do so. So I just wanted to let you know what, what, what my thinking is going forward. So I have just three comments about this really interesting conversation. And frankly, it's really interesting to hear sort of debate about the temporary issue. And so I wanna say three things. One is to throw it back to Sergio uh, in thinking about how we started this project at Zeal is framed around the Global Compact for Refugees. And really that is just pitching at the international level, the same dilemma that we see acted out here, which is the bifurcation of refugees and everybody else who migrates. And so much of what we have talked about is precisely about how unsustainable those distinctions are. Of course, refugees, some refugees uh, have particular kinds of high skill and others have different kinds of skill and so on. Of course, refugees are workers. Of course, they have families. But we are all so invested in the uh, classification regime that starts with the Global Compact for Refugees versus the Global Compact for Migration and is replicated everywhere down the line in national, provincial it, legislation everywhere. And that some of this conversation is just pushing up against that chronic kind of problem and challenge. And I wondered if Azil at some point in its conclusions about the Global Compact for Refugees is gonna be thinking about that sort of starting point and the, and the challenges that poses. The other is about these, you know, could you do what you've done with Ukraine more widely? Well, of course you could, I suppose, in certain ways. But I, I think if we're not talking about, you know, if we're not thinking about Afghanistan versus Ukraine and talking about race and Islamophobia, then we're kind of missing a lot of what's going on here about, yes, what is hypothetically possible and why are things not happening on the ground? And just to add a little data point to that, um, you know, the Canadian government, one of the reasons it has given for not acting to uh, resettle people who are still within Afghanistan uh, has to do with a criminal law, a law, a provision in our criminal code that makes it an offense to provide any material support to um, an organization defined as terrorist. Well, the Taliban is defined as terrorist by the Canadian government. And so one of the arguments of the Canadian government is that it can't go in and do the things nor can organizations go in and do the things required to provide support and extract people, because that would bring those organizations in the Canadian government in violation of the Canadian Criminal Code in respect to providing terrorist support. Well, if you don't see that as a kind of racialized, Islamophobic, you know, you're missing what's going on, I think. <laughs> so if we got to, you know, if we want to know, well, could this be done elsewhere in a different circumstance? Of course it can, but we're not having a complete conversation unless we kind of acknowledge some of the other things that are happening here. Um, and on the on the temporariness, um, you know, temporariness seems to serve, you know, the, the, the idea that people are coming with a temporary purpose, there's, you know, be, uh, that people are coming to do jobs that are only temporarily needed. People are coming temporarily because the government doesn't want them here long term. But now we're hearing about another use of temporary versus permanent, which is processing time. It's not for any of those reasons that we're processing people as temporary. It's really because we can do it faster. You know, that's part of the story we're telling about why. But I think it's sort of important to think about that's a choice. It's not inherent that temporary applications can be processed more quickly than applications for permanent residence. Things can be done differently. And so I would caution against 
endorsing bringing people over on temporary permits because it's faster when that's a kind of contingent choice about how government invests its resources, what it does and how it doesn't. Um, and if, you know, it seems to me that by dint of geography, if nothing else, when people come to Canada as refugees <coughs> from Ukraine, Afghanistan, anywhere else, they may think they're coming temporarily, but almost all of them will end up remaining permanently. And so if we acknowledge that at the outset, I think that gives us a different perspective on the choices of processing regime uh, that we're using. That's all I wanted to say. I want to put it back to uh, Roberto and Andrew for final words. Um, and I preface this, of course, with a thanks to everybody. Thanks a lot, Indina, Audrey. Um, 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 I'd like to take this opportunity just to, to, thank, uh, to thank again all the speakers and participants uh, for, 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 this, uh, for, this, uh, for this debate and for being here today and not just for this but really for all the support throughout uh, this uh, research uh, process over, over the previous months. Uh, um, I would like to close by saying that uh, we are now working, we will be working with Andrew on the final uh, version of the report. and. Uh, uh, we will be happy to share this uh, with you over uh, over the coming months. Andrew, if you have uh, any. Yes, thank you, Roberto, and thank you also to all the panelists. I think um, you know, just putting this uh, discussion today in a bit of a larger context, I think we, we often can focus on you know, just uh, the specificities of Canadian complementary pathways. And they are, I think, a very interesting case for us to then learn about best practices and also then uh, perhaps areas for further improvement for other places. But we can see then that our discussions today apply for uh, complementary pathways in more than just Canada. And the Talent Beyond Boundaries, of course, received investment from the uh, Global Innovation Fund in 2017 to create similar pathways for labor uh, migration using refugees in Morocco and also in the United Arab Emirates. These complementary pathways are something that is are nascent and yet growing all over the planet. And so with discussions like we're having today, we can hopefully contribute to their improvement for the greater accessibility of people, not just to protection and durable solutions in Canada, but to many other contexts through learning with the Canadian experience. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I'd just like to, you know, maybe say one more word in thanks to Sergio for his leadership on the Azil project the opportunity to participate in it. Um, you in a room wouldn't have a sense of the enormity of this undertaking and his leadership and um, how much wonderful work has been done under this um, under his uh, guidance and, and management and leadership. So uh, in closing, I just really want to say uh, a big thanks to Sergio and of course to Andrew um, and to Roberto. What I'd like to suggest is for those of you who are interested in hearing in thinking a little more about Dublin, um, perhaps we can, can we stay on the line for another few minutes and engage with Jens um, and continue to do that. And for the rest of you, I will wish you all a wonderful day and a real thanks uh, for your contributions, participation, and for your time. And here's to continued conversations uh, within and across borders. Thank you. Let me say that I do hope that Roberto and Sergio would also have some minutes to, to remain online here because uh, uh, the two of you are certainly uh, in many ways better placed than me to account for the, for, for the uh, negotiation process uh, on, on the revision of the acquis.